Go ahead, Harvey. No, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to suggest that Roberto um, just text Drew and let him know he can call in by phone as well. Yes. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, let's go ahead and start off the uh, police and fire board meeting uh, for October 6, 2022. Um, let's do a quick roll call. Uh, Drew Lanza, he's trying to get connected, but he will be here. Uh, myself, Andrew Gardner is present. Um, Trustee Kwan. Here. Trustee Ganapati. I'm here. Trustee Lee. He's late, but he'll be joining later. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Trustee Menon? Here. Trustee Vado? What about Santos? <laughs> I'm saving the best for last. <laughs> well, that's not in the order. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Santos? I'm here. And Trustee Vado? I don't think I heard him. He's here. Okay. And Trustee Wilson. Uh, the best for last. Trustee Wilson, I'm here. All right. Um, so we've got a couple of people that are absent, but they will be here in the next, uh, probably the next five, 10 minutes. So we will have a full quorum or a uh, full board. So, so next we are going to just go ahead and jump into closed session. And then once we get off closed sessions, we'll go ahead and, and do order of the day and consent calendar. So just hold tight and we'll go to closed session.
session may tackle to the second the first there is no report out but we will be voting um, in open session um on peru's compensation over to you may tech and also for item 1b in closed session the plan and member kenneth williams has agreed to a written settlement agreement regarding action to be taken due to the member's conviction of a felony in 2008 the agreement essentially provides for the member's current monthly allowance to be reduced for the rest of his life by 10% starting on March 1, 2023, based on the facts and circumstances of Mr. Williams' case. The member has also waived and released any and all claims against the plan arising out of the board member's actions under the municipal code. Thank you. Great. Um, let's go ahead and jump right into the meeting. Um, orders of the day, standard things. We, we're all showing good Zoom. Um, Etiquette. So if it's temporal, the question you have, go ahead and jump in, interrupt the speaker. You don't have to raise your hand on Zoom. But other than that, we'll go formally around for votes. And if it's a detailed subject, we'll go formally around for comments. Um, we There's nothing to wave. Sunshine on. Uh, the floor is open. Anybody from the public uh, want to make a comment? Uh, if not, uh, the first item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Does anybody want to pull anything off the consent calendar? No, motion to approve by Santos. I have a motion to approve by Santos. Do I have a second? A second, Gardner. Gardner Gard Gard will second. Let's go around. Andrew? Aye. David Kwan? Aye. Sunita? Aye. Howard? Yes. Eshvar? Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave Wilson? Aye. Chair Lanza, I vote aye as well. Um, if you're out there, Prabhu, uh, it's your turn now for investments. Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good morning, trustees. So we just have the one item on the agenda today for investments, and that's the presentation of the fee report. And this is something that we bring to the board uh, every year, either in September or October, and then after that, take it to the city council. And uh, just to remind the board, uh, this is one of the most comprehensive fee reports produced by any, any public plan out there. I believe only a handful of uh, public plans, three or four outside of us, that produce such a comprehensive fee report. And this year, the fee report was, uh, was uh, prepared by investment officer, Eric Sang. Uh, who joined the system last uh, at the end of last year, and uh, he prepared this with the, the assistance of some of the other IAOs. Uh, it's a very difficult and time-consuming exercise because uh, the data has to come from multiple sources. So thank you, Eric, for doing that. 
And also to remind the board, uh, in years past, I have actually presented this with uh, trustee, former trustee Sunzeri at the city council. And last year uh, I presented this with trustee Sunita. Uh, with that introduction, I'm actually gonna turn this over to Dinesh to present this year's fee report. Over to you, Dinesh. Thanks, Prabhu. Let me share my screen. Great. So as uh, Prabhu mentioned, this is our annual fee report for calendar year 2021. It's a big undertaking because only a few, a handful of public pension plans do this. There's a lot of work involved to gather the information and scrub it to get it to this format. So the way that we go about doing this is first by requesting all of our managers fill out various fee templates to gather data. For the private funds, we ask them to fill out the ILPA fee reporting template. ILPA stands for the Institutional Limited Partners Association. Um, and for the public funds, we ask the public markets funds, we ask them to fill out a simplified version of this template. Once we get those fees back, we scrub the data, do some quality control, make some updates, ask the managers to provide information that in some cases is missing or isn't clear, um, and then aggregate it all together based on different asset classes and rolling up to the overall plan. We also gather fee data and expense data on other vendors, our staff salary expenses, consultants, custodian bank, and other vendors that we use. Um, so there's two reports associated with this item. There's a long form version of the presentation that has a lot of numbers, as well as an appendix that's intended to comply with the California fee reporting law. Uh, what I'll focus on is this shorter presentation that goes through the 2021 fees, as well as show some of the trends, since this is the seventh year that we've been producing this report, and we have a long history to be able to show how it's changed over time. So getting into the report here on the left-hand side, we show the total expense ratio over the last five years. Uh, for 2021, you'll see a total expense ratio of 1.66% as compared to 1.21% in the previous year. There's three categories of fees that we're capturing here. So the blue bars are fund management fees, orange bars are incentive fees or profit sharing, and lastly, the dark brown is operating expenses. So looking at the year-over-year -year change, there's really no change in management fees. It's flat from 52 basis points to 53 basis points year-over-year. -year. What did change is the dark, the orange bar, which is incentive fees, from 0.53% in 2020 to 1.03% in 2021. So a really large jump in incentive fees. What might be surprising is if we look down towards the middle of the page, the return of the plan didn't actually change very much from 13.7% in 2020 to 14.6% in 2021, so an increase of roughly a percent. What did change is the composition of underlying funds that contributed to that overall return. So for private markets in 2021, the return was 38%. Private markets funds typically have an incentive fee associated with the returns of those. So in good times, we'll be sharing some of those profits with the fund managers. In bad times, we won't be. Public equity, on the other hand, produced a 16% return in 2021, so much lower. If we look at 2020, private markets produced 8%, public equity produced 21%. So the past years were more driven by public equity. In 2021, it was driven by private markets. The inverse of the profit sharing also holds true. So in depending on how the rest of 2022 plays out, it's quite possible that incentive fees in some private asset classes could be negative in 2022. So that'll be interesting to see. Since we don't have much to compare against, what we tried to do is put together a comparison on data that we do have, which is shown on the right-hand side of the page based on the financial reports of different public pension plans. So the police and fire plan is shown as the green ovals. You'll see that we're really in the middle of the pack. The reason that these fee ratios are much lower than the comprehensive fees that we showed on the left-hand side is that these, based on governmental accounting standards, are only based on observable fees that are either by invoice or directly written in a statement that we receive from a fund manager. What is missing is the incentive fees that are often just deducted from the net asset value. And unless you go to the level of detail and effort of capturing those as we do in the comprehensive fees, those won't be captured. I'll move to this slide, which shows that fees are really a function of two things. First, asset allocation. So a greater allocation towards strategies like private markets would expect to have a higher fee ratio. Uh, the other thing is the implementation of the asset allocation. So within a certain asset class, such as public equity, 
there's a decision to invest in passive equity, active equity, or hedge funds within that program. So what we show here is that since 2016, there's been a decline in the fee ratio for management fees by 38 basis points. So taking advantage of really two things that I'll get into. And on a dollar basis, this translates to about $4.1 million as shown on the right-hand side, even though the plan assets have grown tremendously since 2016. So the first thing that drove that decrease in management fee ratio is the increased allocation towards passive funds. So here on the right-hand side, the, the, bar, the blue bar shows passive allocation. So in 2016, about a quarter of the plan was in passive strategies. In 2021, that increased to 44%. Hey, Dinesh, would you argue that they're still active, but we are the people doing the active part? Could you make that argument? In a way, it can be, uh, depending on the type of passive strategies. It, it could be, yeah, that's absolutely right. And the second item to point out on the, the change is the reduction in allocation towards hedge funds. So on the left-hand side of the page, we have a contribution to that active allocation of management fees broken down into public strategies, private strategies, and hedge strategies. So hedged being the dark brown, and in 2016, that represented 32 basis points of the management fee. If we fast forward to 2021, that only represented seven basis points. The chart on the right shows how that reduction took place, which is really driven by the reduction in allocation, which are those blue bars. So in 2016, the allocation was 19% towards hedge funds. In 2022, it was down to 4%. So that reduction in higher cost strategies has also contributed towards the reduced um, management fee ratio. So with that, I'll go back to this summary slide and open up to further questions. Thanks. Um floor is open. Let me ask first question. You know, Prabhu, I hadn't thought about that, but let's make sure we capture Prabhu as we go to incentive compensation, that to some extent we are taking on some of the active role. There's probably some way to work with Dinesh to kind of figure out how much of the fees we could argue should be shifted internally. You know what I'm saying, Prabhu? Yeah, yeah, good point, Drew. Yes, yeah. and yeah, we will certainly do that. Yeah, well, yeah, we're, I have a funny feeling for when we go forward with the council in a couple of months, we're going to be cobbling together pennies, which is actually probably smart. Uh, floor is open. Any other questions for Dinesh? Uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead, David. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the great report. This is, uh, I'm sure, a lot of work. A great presentation, Dinesh. Um, just an expectation going forward. Um, do you expect the fees or expense ratio to be pretty consistent now? Uh, what we see today is going to be pretty consistent going forward? Yeah, I would say for management fees, it probably should be consistent, maybe slightly higher as the private markets program continues to build up. But also the, the benefit on private markets is that we have been allocating towards private strategies for several years now. And there's always a J curve associated with those private investments paying on committed capital. But as that capital continues to get called and we mature as a private markets program, that ends up to stabilize. So yeah, I would expect it to stay somewhere in the same ballpark, no significant increases expected. Okay, thank you. Good, um, Sunita, I think you were gonna yeah. ask something. Uh, hey, Dinesh, uh, great presentation. Couple of questions. One is, um, I thought that the majority of the passive strategy was for, uh, I had a great uh, meeting with Christina earlier this week, but was in the US public equity universe, which the allocation is about 24%. How does that compare with the 44% that you're showing here? So that includes other asset classes, including fixed income, where there's a significant component towards passive strategies as well. Okay, so the, 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 the difference of 20% is coming from there. Right. So obviously private equity is not passive. Right. Although for private markets, we do have the passive proxy. So there is a small allocation towards Russell 3000 within the private markets allocation. Okay. Because that 44% number really did stick, stick out. Uh, okay. Uh, and then the other question was uh, the incentive fees being so large last year, is that 
maybe this is a naive question, but is is that typically in a year where we get a big payout from some of these funds? Because when is the incentive fee actually paid? So the incentive fees are actually paid to managers when we get realizations and distributions back. What mm -hmm. we're capturing here is accrued incentive fees. So it's not all fees that were actually paid. So just because valuations increased oh. in some cases, this ratio could be higher and very well, it could be negative in future years if returns end up being negative and that um, incentive allocation ends up being negated. So it's based on the NAV of the of the private uh, market fund, essentially. Correct, yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. Sure. Uh, We're still open. Hi, Dinesh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Very, very, very productive, uh, very good presentation. Uh, the question on um, management fees, you said they're likely to stay the same. Are you implying that uh, that there's not going to be any any more uh, rotation into hedged allocation strategies, or is, is that not changing? I think at a high level, it really depends on the asset allocation. If there were changes in the asset allocation to increase allocation towards market neutral strategies, then perhaps it could be. But other than that, there's no no expectation within the implementation of the asset allocation as is to increase hedge funds. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Thanks. Sure. Floor is still open. Dinesh, this is absolutely first rate work. I cannot compliment you highly enough. And as we head into this season of incentive compensation, probably six, nine months from now, um, Peru and I, as we've talked about it, this presentation and level of detail is going to answer clearly one of the top two or three questions the city council is going to ask, which is, and they're not crazy, how rich are you making people off our dime? And this this presentation absolutely answers that question. Thanks, Dinesh. Uh, you want to wrap up, Prabhu? Yeah, I, that's the only item on the agenda uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, you know, one of my goals is when I grow up, I want to be able to present as well as Dinesh does. <laughs> Oh, well said. Well, said. it's a, it's a booming stentorian voice is what does it. Exactly. Um, any questions for Prabhu or Dinesh? Um, it's we've been doing this for about ninety minutes. I've got um, about five minutes. Let's take a break until five minutes after the hour, so seven or eight minute break, and then we'll pick up new business when we come back.
did we get quorum? Hello, can you guys hear me? True, I, I think you. we do have quorum. Um, right. Trustee Santos is still away, but uh, that's fine. We, like we, we can have. get we can get going. He'll be back in a minute. Okay. Um, uh, new business. Go ahead, uh, Roberto. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll, I'll be trying to be quick. Uh, just a couple of updates uh, from the um, staff standpoint. We just onboarded two new benefit senior analysts at the office uh, last month. Uh, Teresa Mayer came to us uh, for the health position from uh, PRNS uh, at the city and Han Van, uh, who is on the pension side, came to us from DOT and both of them have many years of experience with the city, so welcome both. Look forward to working with them. And we also kick off recruitment activities uh, for the recently vacated um, staff specialty position in the health area. Uh, talking about health, I wanted to remind everyone that we have uh, open enrollment for, it, it, it lasts from November 1st to November 30th, and that's the, the health, open health enrollment for the retirees. We actually are planning to have an in-person health fair this year, the first one in a few years because of COVID-19, which uh, right now um, it is expected to take place on November 2nd, at the Leininger Lain Center, where the uh, federated retirees have the usual meetings from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, in anticipation of open enrollment, uh, open enrollment packets are expected to be mailed out later this month, probably closer to October 31st, so that members have them in hand for the month of November. And uh, obviously, uh, in addition to the in-person health fair, uh, members will have multiple opportunities um, to attend virtual online webinars, and of course, have one-on-one -on -one consultation time with vendors in addition to the in-person health fair. Um, and lastly, I wanted to let you know that the city lifted the uh, masking mandate back in September, September 12th. And the, the city actually is closed this coming uh, Monday 10 uh, in, observance of, in observance of Indigenous Peoples Day holiday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, floor is open. Anybody have a... Hey, Bridget, I know Pam said she wouldn't be here. Do you know if she sent a representative? Yes, uh, Scott, Scott Hughes, I believe. Uh, that is he's there. Hi, Scott. Yes. Hi, Mr. Pena. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you. Good. Good. Hey, Thanks for having Scott. me here today. I apologize that uh, Council Member oh. Foley was unable to make it today. Uh, she's <clears throat> visiting some family she hasn't seen in quite some time. So, uh, but she tells me that she said for me to send everyone her best. Uh, right. Also, in, in addition to that, Mr. Pena, I believe uh, the Council Member, uh, along with Council Member Davis, I, I believe you had a meeting to discuss the uh, joint uh, meeting between uh, the ret retirement board and uh, uh, city council. Is that correct? Co correct. Thank you for the reminder. That is true, and and that's a good reminder. The uh, initially uh, was scheduled for October 17, and now has been officially uh, delayed to next year. Uh, we're still working on the on the time. Uh, Tentatively, I think we thought about February or March, but I think the goal is to take place before the annual um, budget presentation by the mayor to the city. So I believe uh, everyone felt it was in, uh, in the uh, retirement board's uh, best interest to meet with the new council, uh, since we have uh, potentially so many changes uh, occurring in, in January, but uh, with enough time to be able to get any last minute uh, uh, ideas or thoughts into the incorporated into the budget. Does that sound oh, right to you? That sound, that's exactly yeah. right. Thank you. Scott. Great. All right. And I just have a real short report. Uh, I, I, I apologize. I didn't have too much uh, notice here. 
but uh, I just wanted to let you know that the uh, council member continues to uh, advocate on behalf of the retirement board uh, for expanded health benefits, uh, including mental health uh, benefits to be added to uh, to your package there. Uh, she, at the at a recent council meeting, uh, both herself and council member Sparza uh, brought up the issue of uh, expanding those benefits uh, for mental health retirees. Um, and uh, currently that was not part of the package, uh, but uh, they have asked staff to go back and explore the costs associated with those. Uh, and uh, currently we were sort of just in a holding pattern as staff is going out and uh, doing their work and they'll report back to council at a later date. Uh, but it's one of those items that uh, that we know that uh, the board has really uh, has encouraged the council member to push hard on and and she's doing everything in her power to advocate on behalf of other retirees and uh, hopefully we'll get a favorable favorable report back from staff in the upcoming months. Are there any other questions I could answer for you on that? Yeah. Or any, uh, or any other related item? Yeah, great. Floor's open. Anything for Scott by way of Pam, for Pam by way of Scott? Anybody? <laughs> I always got it right the first time. Hey, Scott, thanks a lot. That was great. Pretty typical. That sound, almost sounded like what Pam usually presents. <laughs> Good job. Uh, that is a huge, huge compliment there. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, um, on to item 4C, um, uh, CIO position. Can I just turn that over to you, Eshvar? Can you handle that? Yeah, thank you, Drew, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, uh, you know, in the last board meeting, uh, this board had suggested uh, a raise of 4 to 5% uh, for the CIO um, and sent it over to the federated board uh, for their discussion. Um, the federated board, uh, and I've you know, talked to Anurag, listened to the Fed discussion. Um, I think their view was that uh, they would like to the compensation to be higher. Um, and I think the discussion there was something on the order of maybe 10%, or in some cases, you know, some people may be suggested more, maybe the right number in terms of the performance um, of, of their fund. Uh, as a compromise, uh, this is the way I read it, uh, they suggested since we were at 4 to 5% and they were at a high number, that 7% uh, probably made sense and that's what they approved. Um, and my recommendation is that this board adopts that and approves the 7%. Do you want to make that as a motion, Eshvar? Yes, I'll make a motion uh, that we adopt a 7% increase for the CIO. Second by Santos. <laughs> I've uh, got a motion by us for a second by Dick. Um, any comments, questions before we vote? Uh, we discussed this obviously at some length. Close session. Go ahead, Andrew. You go. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I will um, just want to make a few comments. Um, I, you know, I, I support uh, the seven percent. I think that's a, you know, it's a, it's good in between number. You know, from what Federer is thinking about and what we were thinking about, um, I would implore this uh, this community or this board and 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 more of the JPC to go and revisit um, the cortex work um, in regards to trying to more solidify how we come up with uh, an appropriate um, MPP, you know, um, compensation award. Um, you know, it, as you can as you can see, there was a difference between the federated and police and fire. You know, everybody wanted to go ten percent or higher. Um, it, we were trying to be a little more on the conservative side while we get the incentive program, um, you know, worked out and implemented. Uh, but you know, trying to for us to start making decisions on the same data points, I think it would help both boards. Um, you know, in in future future years. So um, I hope the JPC would uh, revisit uh, what we did with Cortex. And I know this was a, the year where we said that we would implement um, the Cortex uh, policies and make changes as we go. This is like a trial run. Um, and so I think this is an area that needs to be revisited just so it could be go a little bit more smoother. Um, and, you know, we could have, you know, specific data points you know, if someone achieves, you know, this data point, it equals to X percent of merit increase um, type of thing. So that's my only comment, but I do support the 7%. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me, let me piggyback on that. You know, I feel the same way you do, Andrew. 
there need to be two systems here and we're, we're constrained by the city system. And I think we need to tighten that up. We'll use Cortex. We said we wanted to be the best performance review system um, in the city, you know, regular stuff, lots of uh, 360 review stuff. But there's a second piece, incentive compensation. And I, I get the feeling you're right. We're sort of like desperately trying to squeeze the round peg of the city uh, compensation system is a square hole of the incentive compensation. So let me be on the record now. So Prabhu and staff, anybody watching this, you know, when the dinosaurs reappear, they generated hundreds of millions of dollars in outperformance. What do I mean by that? I mean, a similar system made hundreds of millions of dollars less than we made. And we're talking, as Sunita mentioned, um, we're talking about $5,000, Prabhu and staff probably generated close to $500 million of outperformance. And we've got to square that circle. Um, clearly, we've shown that our thesis that if we had a good staff and a good CIO, we could generate a lot of alpha um, has proven to be true. And the rules of alpha are the guys that generate a lot of alpha, the gals get to keep part of that. So I agree with Andrew. We, I think we need to tighten up what we do on the city side and i agree 100 cortex has shown us the way but i also think we need to introduce this um incentive compensation system hey real quick harvey you want to um um talk to ashwar about adding that to his motion i'm sorry about adding what you you just sent me a text uh oh. saying what was it that need to be added harvey to, to match uh, and be consistent with the federated motion that they adopted at their last meeting. The motion here should uh, not only include the 7% uh, merit raise, but five additional executive leave days. As the maker of the motion, as far do you accept yes. that amendment? Yes, I accept the amendment. Dick, as the seconder of the motion, do you accept that amendment? Yes, I do. Great. Thank you. Um, that, thanks, Harvey, for keeping us straight on the straight and narrow. Anybody else have any comments from, from uh, the floor? Uh, if not, let's go around. We'll take the vote. Um, Andrew. Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Eshwar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave Wilson. Aye. And Chair Lanza, I vote aye as well. You keep doing good work like that, Ashford. Pretty soon, somebody's going to peg you to be chairman. You watch out when that arrow comes your way. Um, uh, 4D. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, probably you, Roberto. Why don't you take 4D? So, actually, 4D is a city request to drop health care coverage for affected members under the city Medicare mandate uh, pursuant by the Muni Code. I actually will turn this to Sandra Castellano, our benefits manager, who worked uh, closely with Make That Sheen uh, from the you know, general counsel from, for the board. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sandra. Sandra? Thank you, Roberto. Good, good morning, everybody. I think Maytech was going to kick this off. Maytech, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm going to walk you guys through the provisions of the San Jose Municipal Code at issue so you can get a sense of what the, the code says. Um, and then to frame um, the issue and the facts today, as well as our recommendation. So please let me know if you can see my screen. And if you need it bigger, I can certainly do that. Uh, no, that's that's loud and clear. Keep going, Maytac. Okay. I'm just going to scroll. So this is the back of materials that we were provided to you for item um, 4D, which we'll, we'll come back to this, but this is a list of recommendations that we're requesting the board accept by motion today. There's the background section, the number of people that have been affected, and here goes the municipal code here. So as a requirement for retirees to participate in the um, city provided health insurance plans, if you are a uh, eligible, you have to meet certain requirements as specified in the Muni Code. One of, that, um, one of those requirements for people who are eligible for Medicare is specified in Subdivision M, which provides here, effective March 31st, 
2017, a member or dependent and or survivor who is eligible for retiree health benefits in this plan and who is eligible for Medicare coverage shall be required to enroll in Medicare Part A and B during the individual's initial enrollment period under the federal rules. That's to just get enrolled in Medicare. Additionally, the plan member and or the dependent and or the survivor who is eligible for Medicare shall also enroll in the Medicare plan provided by the city and assign their Medicare benefits to the Medicare plan um, if the health, health coverage provider requires it. So under the Medicare mandate, there's an initial compliance requirement that one, during your initial enrollment period, meaning within the period specified under federal law for you to enroll into Medicare once eligible, you A, have to first enroll in it, and B, you have a certain amount of time to assign your benefits to the healthcare provider um, under contract with the city. That is called the Medicare mandate. So failure to meet the Medicare mandate, again, that means one, enrolling during your initial enrollment period, and two, assigning your Medicare coverage to the healthcare provider within the time specified. And here, um, the provision lays it the time specified. If you do not meet those initial compliance requirements, the plan is required under the Muni Code to cease your coverage and drop you. Um, so the provision here for the dropping highlighted here, I'll read it out to the board and for the record. If a member fails to meet the requirements set forth above within the members or dependents or survivors initial enrollment period, and here's the period that allows you to assign, this is the specified period for the Medicare assignment, which begins three months before the members and or the, the affected members uh, or dependents or survivors 65th birthday or other me Medicare eligible event, or and concludes four months after the plan member and or dependents and or survivor 65th birthday or other event providing eligibility for it, enrollment in Medicare, again, a Medicare eligible um, triggering event, the plan shall, this is the important part here, the plan shall cease to provide retiree healthcare benefits until the plan member or the dependent or survivor completes such requirements. So you have to enroll in Medicare and assign your benefits to maintain your coverage once you become Medicare el eligible. And I'll, again, I, I call this the initial Medicare compliance. And if you do fall out of compliance and the plan does drop you, the plan member and the qualifying dependents shall be re-enrolled in the retiree healthcare benefits beginning on the first day following of the following month after such requirements have been completed. Now to re-enroll into Medicare, there is a open enrollment period that is only open, I believe, um, Sandra can correct me if I'm wrong on this, like once a year from January to March. And that's the window of time that you're allowed to re-enroll. So if you fall out of enrollment, you can't re-enroll until there's that federally provided Medicare um, window to re-enroll. Now, as you see here in this Medicare mandate, it only talks about the initial compliance. Um, where it says the plan ceases to provide retiree health care benefits until the plan member completes such requirements as specified above. And the requirements that we had specified above are twofold. One, that you initially enroll during your initial enrollment period, and two, that you assign within um, the period specified here, which is four months after your Medicare um, eligibility date. What it doesn't do is talk about what happens to a member if they lose Medicare coverage after they've done the initial compliance. So this is the area that we're going to be talking about today for the purposes of our memo. So um, I, I do see a hand up from Trustee Santos. So before I go on, I, I wanted to see what, um, if I can answer your question. Uh, Trustee Santos, you're on, you're on mute. Drew, do you hear me okay? I'm sorry. Yep, no, we got you now, Dick. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maytag, for trying to explain that. I think Ray Storms is on the um, air, too, trying to probably get through for a, maybe a question. I know how hard it is to get a hold of Social Security or Medicare. It's really a tough process for the potential retiree. So are we given some grace period? And it sounds like we are. In other words, um, if they can't do it, uh, eventually they'll be enrolled back once they go through the process. That's what it sounds like. 
so for this particular population, when we get to the recommendation sections, yes, we are going to give the affected members um, that are subject to be dropped here uh, a grace period to, to allow them to cure. So the population that we're talking about here is that there are um, a population of individuals who have lost Medicare coverage after they, they had initially complied. So initially, when they turned 65, they enrolled in Medicare, they assigned their benefits, great. But somewhere down the line, they lost Medicare coverage. And so they are now shifted to, um, so for the purposes of the statute, they've complied. And so there's no specific provision that requires us to drop them. The only specific provision in the code that mandates the board in the plan to drop them is if they don't meet that initial compliance. Now, however, although not specifically specified in the statute for this particular population, if we were to allow a member who initially complied with the Medicare mandate and subsequently lost coverage, that would frustrate the purpose of the statute. The statute in, implicitly implies that a member must maintain Medicare coverage for um, them to avail themselves to the city plan for this reason. The city passed this proposal um, in municipal code provision because Medicare offsets some of the city's um, costs for providing benefits to that member. So that is why they created this initial enrollment and compliance or initial compliance requirement of enrolling and assigning. Now, if they fall out of compliance, that would undermine the purpose of the statute, the cost saving measure that the city had initially passed the statute for. So based, we've been working with the city on this, noting that there's an, uh, some ambiguity in the statute. And the city has uh, stated their intent during our negotiations with them that it's always been the city's intent that these members stay enrolled for the purpose of that, that I had just mentioned, that it would frustrate the purpose of the statute. The reason why we have the statute is cost saving measure for the city, for those who are Medicare eligible. And so we've worked with them to uh, see what we can do. Um, and so a lot of our recommendations, which we'll get back to um, after Sandra presents you the factual situation regarding um, how many members are affected and whatnot, um, we'll discuss why we are providing the recommendations we are. And we also, uh, before we take a, a action on the recommendation, we do have uh, Cheryl Parkman from OER, and we also have the city's attorney's um, representative, uh, Kevin Fisher, who will speak on behalf of the city attorney, if he so likes, um, to weigh in on the city's perspective. So, Sandra? Oh, I think Mr. actually I have one hand up for Ray Storm. That's right. Is Ray Storm has their hands up. Ray, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, a few questions on this particular issue. Um, Anthem doesn't do it the way Kaiser does it, apparently. That's right. How many people have we lost in Anthem? from Medicare from this particular type of situation? Do we have that number in Anthem? That's the, I, I don't know if we have that number readily available for the purposes of this meeting. Maybe Sandra can weigh in uh, on that. I do not have that number. Let me see if I can reach out to staff and if I can get that. Um, because I'd, I'd be real curious to see what happens to those people when they're dropped. My other question is, how have we reached out to these six individuals uh, one of which is a survivor, how have we reached out to them to let them know what's going on? One of the issues I have is a lot of times, I hate to say it, retirees get something from the city and it goes in the round file. It's not right, but that's what happens. Do we have phone number contacts? And is it possible for me to get a list of the people so I can make contacts and say, hey, you're, you're in some situation here? that they need to rectify and do we know how they lost their medicare standing or status so let me answer your questions i think you have three questions i'll answer them um, one Thank by you. one so the first question regarding anthem and what happens after a member has been dropped by anthem what happens then they the member and the qualifying defendants have the ability to re-enroll in their benefits once they're eligible to do that and that would be the federal medicare um, open enrollment period from january to march um, in the interim period, they will not have coverage under the city plan. Um, they would be out on their own for the Anthem um, population. So, the, and I, I believe your second question then was related to, and correct me if I'm misstating your question, is that um, have we provided notice to these individuals under Kaiser, the affected members, that they may be subject to drop 
No, we have not yet reached out to them. That's part of our recommendation that we reach out to them, provide them notice, and also work with them and help them cure so they, they can come into compliance. And I think your third question was whether or not we know why these members have lost Medicare coverage. We do not have that information. We do not track Medicare coverage for these particular members. Kaiser tracks it. Um, that's information that we don't have um, readily available. But a very likely possibility is that for the reason why they lost coverage is that they, they were not able to pay their, their share of the Medicare costs for, to maintain coverage. Got it. Because so, there is a cost. They may have had the quarters um, to get Social Security, which then help cover their costs on their Medicare. So they have to pay it out of pocket and maybe they miss payments. That could be yeah, a possibility. That's, that's quite a possibility. I don't know for these particular members, you know, drilled down what each and every one of their issues were, but that that is a possibility. Um, so with that, if you have any other questions, um, if not, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Cassiano. Um, can I get a copy of the members that are affected contact so I can try and help? That information I cannot provide to you. Um, it's confidential information, but uh, we, we will be working with ORS staff and um, OER to make sure these people get their notice subject to the board's direction. Um, yep. The other me. question I have in regards to this, let's say push comes to shove, because you're talking about Kaiser's putting them back on the commercial plan, which they're not supposed to do. We are only a small, small part of Kaiser. I, I know the city population wise our employees there's a large population of our teams that are in kaiser but in the overall kaiser we're we're a, a small cog that's an issue to bring up with the city council we're only here today to address um this affected population um that may be subject to drop uh, what, any issues regarding the contract with kaiser the scope of um, provisions um that's within the purview of the city council Uh, Mr. Chair, D Dick Santos, can't can't we uh, make a request that those people who are retirees that have been dropped, that at least we can send you folks, our administration can send them a memo and say, contact your retiree president for assistance. Can can that we be? We can done? certainly do that. Yeah, we that can would be helpful. Thank that you for the direction. So before um, I, I'll make a note of that. Thank you, Trustee Santos. Um, it, with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Cassiano, the Benefits Division Manager. Uh, Sandra, I think you're, oops, press the wrong buttons, and let me get my notes up here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Maytek. And I will um, say we're happy to um, partner in any way we can with communicating with these people. We we do um, not only send letters to them, but we do call them, um, email, and reach out um, in every way we can to make sure these members continue their Coverage. Thank you, very, thank you commit very to much. doing thank that. You. Very appreciative. Thank you. Yes. So, just explaining some of the details, we do have two healthcare providers, as you know, Anthem and Kaiser. Anthem and Kaiser do operate differently for the members who are Medicare eligible. For Anthem, if a member does not enroll in a and assign to Medicare, or they do not stay enrolled in Medicare, Anthem will drop their coverage automatically. And I'm just communicating with my staff here. We do get um, notifications when that happens from on a monthly report um, from Anthem, and we do follow up with those members if that does. Um, happen or we will start doing that for sure. Um, Kaiser does not drop the members coverage and instead transfers them to a special exception group at a high cost to the city. Um, the affected members at issue here are the members who initially complied with the Medicare mandate but then lost their coverage. Um, we discovered this population of affected members when the city and ORS began working together to enforce the Medicare mandate earlier this year. Um, the city, as Maytek mentioned, has been clear that it intended that the Medicare mandate would extend to this affected population and have asked us to drop their coverage. You know, I will so note that the city has not um, in any way said that we should drop them without going through a due process of giving them a chance to enroll in Medicare. Um, as noted in the memo, we currently have six police and fire members who in this group who initially enrolled in Medicare but then subsequently lost their coverage. Um, and they continue, all six of them continue to be covered under the Kaiser plan at um, a fairly high cost to the city. 
And our uh, plan, as kind of mentioned earlier, is to reach out them proactively. There's a general, there's numerous enrollment periods with Medicare. The general enrollment period, as Maytech mentions, runs from January through March. So we will be reaching out to them after this memo, um, you know, after we get direction from the board on this memo, reaching out to them so that they can begin to plan to reach out to Medicare, schedule their appointments, get enrolled, because they do need to contact Medicare within that three month period during the general enrollment period. And then we will make sure that, that um, we have Medicare uh, workshops now we're offering to members quarterly that they are informed about when those are. Um, we will walk them through the process and um, make sure they get enrolled and without any lapses in coverage. So with that, I think that's all I had to talk about. Well, yeah. To the chair, uh, this is Dick Santos to Maytag and Sandra. Thank you so much for bending over backwards trying to help retirees out in this tough situation. Thank you so much. And and so now I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is go through the recommendations that uh, we are putting before this board to adopt by uh, motion. So as stated in the memorandum, and I'll read them one by one so everyone's on the same page. Um, one, the first is that we would like the board to acknowledge that the plan is obligated to cease providing retiree health benefits to the members who are Medicare eligible who have not initially enrolled in Medicare and who have not assigned a Medicare benefits to the health care provi insurance provided by the city under the Medicare mandate. And so this is a provision already provided by the statute. It's just an acknowledgement of our um, ministerial duty to do that for that population. Those are the people who did not initially comply with the Medicare mandate. Um, and then, so this is the second bullet point goes to the population we're discussing here is where someone initially complied but lost coverage, Medicare coverage. So acknowledge that there's a population of retired members who initially complied with the Medicare enrollment and sign assignment requirements under the meaning code who subsequently lost Medicare coverage and who um, have retiree health care benefits provided under by Kaiser under the city's contract with Kaiser. Another thing to acknowledge is that the city's stated intent that retired members maintain Medicare coverage in order to maintain retiree health benefits in the city provided health care plan. And the city has asked us the plan to drop health care coverage for this population of retired members who initially complied with Medicare enrollment and assignment requirements, but who subsequently lost Medicare coverage. This is the effective member population. And here's the part that goes um, to Trustee Santos and uh, Ray Storm, Mr. Storm's comments. This is where we would ask the board for direct approved direction for staff to provide notice to the effective members that they must be continuously enrolled in Medicare to maintain coverage in the city plan and to allow these members an opportunity to cure their loss of Medicare coverage at the next Medicare open enrollment period. Again, that's from January to March of next year. And to advise these members that if they do not do so, the plan will have to drop them from the city provided retiree healthcare coverage. Um, another uh, recommendation to the board uh, subject is that subject to the board action is to recommend to the city council that at the end of the term of the Kaiser contract in December, 2023, if the parties, meaning the city and Kaiser seek to renew the contract, that they consider adding a provision that requires Kaiser to drop healthcare coverage for Medicare eligible members who do not have the Medicare coverage throughout. And so this would essentially bring the Kaiser contract into the same um, terms as the Anthem one. And the reason for this recommendation is that administration uh, like from an administ administration standpoint, it's very difficult to track who is in Medicare coverage and who loses Medicare coverage. So that's information that the Medicare medical providers have. And this is why in large part, this population flew under the radar for ORS for such a long period of time. We had no idea that these people were on that load. Um, and our last recommendation would be for the board to recommend to the city council that they consider adding language to the municipal code provision to make clear the plan's obligation to cease providing health care benefits to retirees who are Medicare eligible who, who are not enrolled in Medicare continuously after eligibility and who do not assign Medicare benefits to the health care program provided by the city that they have their health care. So this, these are the recommendations uh, for the board for adoption by motion. Um, with that, I see two hands up. Um, first, I, I think Ray, uh, Mr. Storm's hand went up first. 
Yes, I'm sorry I lost connection here uh, on everything. I would like to add, when you go to contact them, not only by mail, maybe by email also, and if you have their phone number, please yeah. try all three methods. Um, like I said, a lot of times they round file things when it comes from the city. It's not right, but it's what they do. I'm just trying to help. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then I, I believe Trustee Wilson, you had your hand up, or maybe you took it down. I took it down. It was the same thing that uh, Ray mentioned, just uh, that we try to aggressively get in touch with uh, these retirees. And Maytech, maybe I just heard back from my staff with a little more information on Anthem. So um, for health manager, so an both Anthem and our office contacts, when we see somebody has dropped their Medicare coverage through Anthem, um, we do reach out. Anthem and, the, and ORS reaches out. Uh, she also says that her experience has been typically, it's not because they stop paying Medicare or disenroll in Medicare, it's that they assign their benefits to another Medicare carrier that's not through us. So as Maytag mentioned area, earlier, there's two steps. Oh. Number one, you have to enroll in Medicare. Number two, you have to assign through ORS. So these are typically that they have just gone in and assigned their coverage through <laughs> another carrier, not, not ORS. And so they don't then re-enroll with us typically. Uh, this is Franco. I, I just want to make a comment. Maybe this is something for Roberto to uh, work with staff. I can see scenarios, multiple scenarios where someone, for example, my email got hacked and AT&T shut it down. Um, and my check goes into my bank account. I moved to Idaho. I would not really have any contact with the city and no need to do a change of address. Or I can see my just not doing it. Um, I pass away. You don't have my wife's contact information. I just don't know if there's something that we can do on the website that stays up permanently and maybe a periodic reminder in the newsletter to make sure that we advise people of the scenarios. Hey, let me ask, let me jump in on That's that idea, point. Franco. Let me, let me, let me ask you a question, Maytag. Hey, can a trustee know the name of these people? We're inside the tent, right? Well, you know, this is confidential member information, and so we would only communicate directly with that member or through ORS. So, so you can't ask Franco and Dick to track them down. I would likely not do that. I would likely okay. Work with them. That's, That's okay. All right. Good. Good enough. Hey, Drew, I got a comment. Yeah. Good. Jump in. Every and we jump in. Floor is open. Yeah. So hearing uh, Sandra's last comments, you know, around uh, Anthem and and what they've done in the past with uh, those members that got dropped, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like we have a process that works, okay? Um, you know, with Anthem, when they get dropped, um, ORS gets notified and ORS and staff are then reaching out, you know, via communication, it could be email, phone, um, you know, uh, mail, and to, to rectify it. The only reason we're here today is because Kaiser has their models a little bit different, and they put you in a different category. And so we've and so they've those members never lost their um, their coverage. Okay, and so so I think the system is not. We don't have to reinvent the system. It seems like the system is working well um, and what staff is doing. We just need to fix the Kaiser part of it. Um, and so I, I feel comfortable with all the recommendations that are here, um, along with what um, Ray Storm has provided in regards to it reiterating, you know, let's make sure we communicate um, across all forms of communication. Thanks. Hey, Andrew, Andrew since you're comfortable with it, do you want to move to accept it? Well, before uh, we do, I did want to provide an opportunity for all OER or um, the city attorney's office if they wanted to make any comments. Yeah, the floor is open, folks. Jump in. Sandra, Ray Storm's here again. Just a comment. If you run into a roadblock where you don't have an address or a phone number, contact me because I may. Okay. We, we, we try and get our people to update their stuff in our database as often as we can. And so if that comes to push, comes to tell me you're, you're getting nowhere, no contact, Call me. I'll look it up and see if I can help. We'll That's do. All. And certainly we can, you know, not tell you why we're asking and we'll just say right. we're having trouble with uh, contacting a member. Exactly. Keep yep. it big. That's fine. And I'll look up the information to see if I can help. And 
Yes. Hi, everyone. Cheryl Parkman, Office of Employee Relations. Hi, uh, Cheryl. You, you know, I believe we're, we're asked here today, uh, the city is asked here today because of the two recommendations. If, uh, I don't know if it's Linda or, or Michelle could scroll down to the, oh, to the next page to, to see the two recommendations that are up for, I believe, actual, uh, besides directing staff to provide uh, you know, uh, more information to to the retirees. And it is something that we've worked very closely with Sandra and her team on. And we're in complete agreement about contacting uh, those retirees and making sure we do everything we can to inform them about this necessary process. What I'm here to talk about today are the two recommendations at the end uh, regarding recommending to city council just to provide the city's perspective that that council chin has has uh, accurately discussed already. Um, in terms of recommending, you know, uh, city council to, uh, you know, look at that that contract language with Kaiser, you know, that's definitely something that if the board feels is necessary, they can do. Uh, you know, all of our contract negotiations are confidential with our with our vendors, and so you're you're absolutely able to recommend that. You know, I would just, you know, caution we don't we would work through, of course, also the city's benefits consultant to see if that is something that would be. Uh, beneficial to us to do so you know that's that's the city's perspective on that I will say the city's perspective on the second recommendation is that we believe that uh, the language does not need to be changed in the municipal code it is implicit it is inherent that someone needs to maintain coverage in in Medicare uh, in order to do so and that is the uh, you know the 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 prerogative of the city to interpret its own municipal code and we've been very clear that that is our intent and so it does not um, you know we don't think that a municipal code is change is needed because it's something that we've all talked about here is something that we would we would just do if somebody is is dropping coverage and of course we would provide them with any sort of uh, necessary communication in order to get back on it and re-enroll so uh, all of you that have been on the board for a while know that it's a very time intensive process in order to change the municipal code. Uh, it's not up for uh, negotiation once the municipal code is done. So we are not trying to negotiate between uh, the city and the retirement boards about how we interpret our own municipal code. So we would just like to move forward with the intent that if somebody uh, is in Medicare and then for whatever reason they assign their coverage to someone over other than ORS that we drop them as the municipal code states at this time. Uh, so we don't, we, you know, you can recommend to city council to change it, but it is not the city's uh, recommendation to change the municipal code and we should just continue to act uh, as as we intend to, to drop people from coverage should they reassign. Uh, you know, if some, if so, a retiree wants to argue about it, we can show them this meeting to say that this is the intent, the communications that have gone back and forth. Uh, you know, Ray Storms is here. Uh, trustee Wilson is here and 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 trustee uh, Votto and trustee Santos and, and trustee Gardner. that communication can go out get in Medicare stay in Medicare and you won't get dropped from your coverage so that's that's our prerogative on that particular issue and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on that floor still open jump in so I have a question actually for Ms. Parkman so say we given the current language on the, the San Jose municipal code and we do hear the city's intent but it's not reflected expressly in the in the muni code and we do drop someone's coverage and they challenge it would the city then be willing to indemnify the board and the plan for dropping them based on the city's stated intent uh, I think that's probably a question for <laughs> for Kevin uh in terms of indemnification, OER can't indemnify anybody, so that would be a question for the city attorney's office. Uh, hi, this is Kevin Fisher, assistant city attorney. Um, that's not really a question we're we're going to answer in this in this public meeting. Okay. Well, for for what it's worth, you know, these two alternative recommendations that Cheryl had mentioned: one, changing the contract terms to align with what. And then provides um, are two alternatives to each other because one, if the city does align their practice for Kaiser with what happens with Anthem, there is no real need to amend the Muni code because by operation of um, the healthcare provider, they would be automatically dropped. And so they would just go in line with what we currently do with Anthem. Um, as an alternative, if that language is not there, we will then stick with our recommendation that the Muni code would. Um, be changed to make it clear that they have to be continuously enrolled. 
we understand the city's position um, and to the extent you can provide that in writing um, once the board has taken action on what it decides to do here um, and which of these recommendations they're going to accept, um, we can cross that bridge at that point. I see a hand up from my colleague, uh, Mr. Leonard. Yeah, thank you, Maytek. Uh, just a comment, you know, uh, many times over a period of several years, the city will adopt various rules and regulations that and, and ordinances that have to be implemented by this board. And uh, in practice, over time, situations arrive, arise that the board has to grapple with, and it looks to its governing ordinances to see how we should deal with those. And sometimes we find under the circumstances that maybe the ordinance doesn't exactly cover the situation and we need some clarity in how to administer the plan because this is essentially our play, part of our plan document. And I think that's what's happened in this instance here where the specific language of, of the ordinance that was adopted several years ago um, does not meet the circumstances that the board's confronted with. We have a, a very cooperative uh, uh, relationship with the city, and that's even written into the ordinance when the city council wants to adopt a change to the ordinance, which is our plan document. They come and seek our uh, advice and recommendations on how that would be implemented. And this is the mirror image of that process where we've come up with a situation that we think it might be helpful for us to be able to have more clarity in the direction in our plan document that we're seeking. So I see this as part of that uh, collaborative relationship that we have with the city. Uh, and, and it would help clarify things from our board's point of view to make this recommendation and, and see if we can tighten up that language so that it avoids any controversy in the future. So I, I would suggest to the board that both of these recommendations are appropriate for this board to make in terms of feedback under its implementation and administration of the plan document that the city has given to us to put into effect. And Harvey, I absolutely agree that we have a very, very wonderful collaborative relationship with ORS staff and uh, with you and with, with Council Chin. And anytime there are other questions about our sometimes very complicatedly <laughs> written municipal code, you know, my office is asked for clarity and we provide that without having to go through a municipal code change. So, uh, you know, if, wherever I can provide clarity on things like, you know, the alternative pension reform framework ordinances, uh, I've done so without having to go through a muni co change. Uh, so I just want to say that if you need something in writing from us that clarifies our intent, we're happy to do so. But I also understand that it is the board's prerogative to make recommendations where they see fit. Uh, so if that is the that is the case, then, you know, that is uh, what will be uh, the board's will. Cheryl, I got a question for you um, in regards to the first recommendation about um, adding language, you know, to Kaiser. How often do you guys um, negotiate that contract? Is that a yearly thing or is it you could do a five year contract type of thing? It just depends on what the city's, um, you know, uh, uh, if we're going to amend a contract, maybe we just do a contract amendment. It depends. I think in, in here, as you can see, our next uh, expiration date is December 2023 and I think the last time we uh, uh, negotiated with them was either 2020 or 2021 so it's they're definitely multi-year deals uh, so when these come up we do RFPs for medical service and we invite uh, the employee groups in order to participate on that but uh, I'm not sure if in 2023 we'll be doing an RFP or we'll be doing an extension that's something that I'm not prepared to to say, but uh, I do understand that if it is a recommendation to city council that we'll do our best in working with our benefit consultant in order to see if this is something that we can uh, we can get across the goal line. Yeah, and I, I kind of should the, should the city council agree, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that, you know, whatever our board recommends, you know, it's up to city council, you know, decide on how to move forward and, and, it's, and it's merely a recommendation. Uh, so I understand that. So I appreciate the information. Thank you. Floor is still open. Anybody else want to give it a go? Oh, just a comment, uh, Mr. Chair. 
I just love to see how people are working together on the behalf of everybody. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we have you've worked for, Sandra has worked really closely with Cheryl um, from OER to address this. It's been a long slog um, to clean up our rules. Uh, we kind of fell out of compliance, but we've been working very diligently from last year through now, so about a year. So kudos to them. They've been working really closely. This It's just one small affected population that we need direction from the board um, based on these recommendations. So I did want to make sure that the board was aware that OER and uh, ORS, a lot of applicant suit here, but they're, uh, <laughs> they are working together and we, we are collaborating. That's good. Um, Andrew, do you want to make the motion um, to accept and adopt this memo? So yeah, yeah, I'll accept one clear, um, clarifying yeah. question for Maytag. So okay. uh, one one of your um, uh, last comments regards to if 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 we recommend um, the the number first item, and the city makes the changes, we really don't need to recommend the second. Um, but then the memo says recommend both. Is it still your and Harvey's recommendation to go forward on both of them, or would you? advise we you know want just want the first one i would recommend on both as um these are just merely recommendations to the city council on things that we see that may need clarification or action on again this is similar to measure g with the um, compensation issues that the, the city council retains control of those issues we don't have control over the city council or the city <clears throat> and so these are just merely recommendations so given that the recommendations we're not sure which of the two the city may act on or accept um, they're just merely recommendations. Okay, thank you. So I'll go ahead and make a recommendation um, on uh, staff's uh, memo here, um, acknowledging the first three bullet points um, on, on oh, page. There's, there's, there's six. There, sorry, ahead. six. One, two, so, so six there. Um, yeah. and, and then uh, the, the follow up. And I recommend, you know, the city to um, add a provision with the Kaiser contract. And then also recommendation to clean up the language uh, around the uh, municipal code um, surrounding the Medicare el eligibility. Second by so, Santos. You voiced that as a recommendation, Andrew. Did you mean to make that as a motion? It is, it, yes. It's part yeah, of my great. motion. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Gardner, second by Santos. Uh, let's go around. Andrew. Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Sunita. Yes. Howard. Yes. As far. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave Wilson. Aye. I'm Chair Lanza. I vote aye as well. Um, looks like uh, Roberto is over to Chiron for uh, 4E, right? Correct. And but before we go to 4E, Mr. Yeah, Chair, sure if you ahead. allow me to take uh, 30 seconds and comment sure. on this, and I just want to. I know it's been a, a, a very challenging and <laughs> difficult process to say the least. Uh, I want to give kudos to staff for the hard work uh, being led by, uh, by obviously Sandra and working with Maytag. But I also want to, you know, uh, uh, just publicly thank uh, uh, the city and OER and Cheryl and, and Jennifer for their um, you know, they have been actually extremely patient with us while we work through this. And so we, we appreciate that as well. So we will try to work through it. Obviously, there are some uh, basic uh, differences, opinion, and a couple of uh, issues. But I think we're trying to move ahead and, 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 and obviously implement what is, what is needed. So thank you, everyone, and kudos to, to the staff for, for, the, for the work. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. Over to you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Let me uh, share my screen here. All right. Oh, we got uh, it, Bill. Great. We're uh, here today to uh, review the economic assumptions for the pension valuation. But uh, before we get started on that, I wanted to hit a couple things first. Uh, this is the beginning of our uh, schedule of actuarial meetings. And so uh, today we're here for the economic assumptions for the pension plan. Uh, next month, uh, we should have some uh, preliminary results on the pension valuation. 
but we will also be here to look at the OPEB assumptions uh, and the amortization method for OPEB, which was a recommendation that came out of the actuarial audit last year. Uh, and then uh, we'll continue with uh, the final pension numbers, hopefully in December and preliminary OPEB results then. We don't expect anything in January, but that uh, may change if, uh, if we get delayed somewhere along the way. And then our final OPEB valuation results will be in at the February board meeting. So uh, kicking off a few months of actuarial um, information on your agenda. And before we get to the economic assumptions, uh, just wanted to update you on our uh, preliminary projections. Uh, we had exceptional investment returns in 2021. Uh, 2022 reversed much of that, but not all of it. Uh, and so uh, our projections now, uh, we estimate on a market value basis, the funded level to drop from 87 to 78%, and but on an actuarial value basis to increase from 77 to 80%. The chart shows the, the blue line is the 2021 projection of the pay down of the UAL. And now we're looking at the red bars. So it's pushed things out uh, a bit, mm. um, but uh, there's still uh, a projected decline in the UAL over the next uh, several years. These uh, projections only cover the uh, changes in the assets. We still have to look at the liabilities and the census data and all of that, uh, as well as any assumption changes that you may make. Here are the uh, projected contributions on the left as a percent of pay, on the right as a dollar amount. Uh, I would note that uh, both as a dollar amount and as a percent of pay, even with the investment returns from 2021, we're expecting a decline um, in the fiscal year end 2024 uh, contributions compared to the 2023 contributions. So uh, we're still projecting a decline. Uh, as a dollar amount, it's about a $6 million decline. Um, but the projections are much higher than they were last year uh, going forward. Um, so, we're definitely seeing the impact of those investment returns. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Ann to get us started on the economic assumptions. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here and uh, to talk about your economic assumptions. Uh, just an overall um, overview of uh, what we're going to do today. We are going to look at the economic assumptions only as those are reviewed every year. Um, the demographic assumptions are reviewed every other year, and we uh, reviewed those last year. So they're, the next study for those won't be until 2023. And the assumptions that we're looking at today will be used in the upcoming 2022 valuation, which determines contributions for fiscal year end 2024. And so we're going to uh, review the price inflation, wage inflation, the amortization payment increase rate, and also the discount rate. So to set the stage, the price inflation assumption is the foundation for all other economic <coughs> assumptions. Uh, it is right now, the current assumption is 2.25%. It's a component of both the wage inflation and also the expected return on assets or the discount rate. Um, the price inflation, although it's a foundation for the economic assumptions, it has very little direct impact on your plan's liabilities, and that's due to your plan's COLA structure. Uh, the tier two or the tier one COLA is fixed at 3% per year, regardless of CPI. There's a small group of uh, retirees, older retirees who get um, small increases or increases associated with CPI to guarantee their purchasing power, but it is a very small older group, so it has very little impact. And then tier two COLAs, they are tied to the Bay Area inflation, but they are capped at 2% um, each year. So if you're 
uh, inflation assumption is greater than that 2%, the, uh, they will, we are assuming that the tier two retirees will receive <clears throat> that cap each and every year. So what do we as actuaries use to develop our recommendations on price inflation? Uh, we do have several tools in our toolbox. Um, and one of those, the most important one, is that we look to what the expectations of the future are for price inflations. Historical inflation we use and set only as a context. It's really what the market looks like going forward that has more of an impact on what that assumption will look like. Um, inflation, as everyone knows, has been very high, historically high. As of August 31st, it was around a little bit higher than 8%. Um, however, expectations for the future uh, remain lower. And a key indicator of future market expectations is what is called break-even inflation. And it's the difference between the yield on the treasuries and the yield on TIPS, which is the infl inflation-protected treasuries. This chart here shows the five-year history of break-even inflation. Um, expectations over the next five years are represented by the green line. The following five years uh, are represented by the five or the yellow line. And then finally, the 20-year expectations of inflation are represented by the blue line. And you can see there's a lot of volatility over the last 18 months in uh, the break-even inflation, all um, around two and a half percent or higher. And currently, those break-even uh, break-even inflation rates are at 2.7 percent over the next five years. And then, looking over the following five years, they do come down a little bit to 2.3 percent. And then, finally, over 20-year uh, looking forward inflation period the expectation is that inflation will be around 2.7%. Now, last year, I uh, just wanna make a note that uh, the break-even inflation for the five and 20 year were around two and a half percent. And at that time, we did not propose um, increasing the inflation assumption. We really had a wait and see philosophy to, to see if this, these expectations, uh, the higher expectations would hold out in the future. So next we look at um, some surveys in their range of CPI assumptions. Starting um, from left to right, we have the range of professional forecasters uh, for, uh, based in the third quarter of 2022. Then we have the Horizon Survey from 2022, which is a compilation of investment consulting firms and what their inflation expectations look like. Then the public sector plan database, which is the national database of large public sector systems and what the inflation assumptions are in those plans. And finally, the California survey, which is a compilation of about 40 large systems in California and their inflation assumptions. So the takeaway here is that in all of these surveys, the inflation expectations are two and a half percent or higher. Um, and of note, uh, the professional forecasters has a significant uncertainty and a wide range of expectations. Uh, their short-term expectations are higher, but they do, uh, the forecasters vary on how quickly or how fast that inflation is expected to drop in the future. And this is largely based on their differing opinions of things like um, the likelihood and timing of a potential recession, the effectiveness of the Fed's monetary policy will be to curb inflation, you know, gasoline prices, et cetera. So all those things go into the uh, wide range of uncertainty for those uh, economic forecasters. Uh, also shown on this graph, we have Makita's most recent assumptions and they're shown in the purple circles and triangles. Uh, the 2.6% over the 10-year period is their 10-year inflation assumption, shown by the purple circle, and then the triangle is shown is their 2.1% uh, expectation over the 20-year period. So in summary, based on where the break-even inflation stands currently and um, the results of these surveys, we are proposing increasing your current price inflation assumption from 2.25 to 
Next, we are going to look at wage inflation, which is used to project. Hey, and can oh, I ask yeah. a question? Sure. Way? Yes. So, if you, if like you said, if uh, if the cola is fixed, why do we even bother about the price inflation? Why is it? Um, we're going to get to that. That's a good question. So, All right, I'll gonna, wait. yes, we're going to get to that with the wage inflation because because what we're seeing in the markets today and within. Um, wages today is that the inflation is having a direct impact on uh, the employees wages right so we are seeing that um, in national local governments as well so basically the price inflation is is the base component of wage inflation and then we have what's called real wage growth which is currently we are assuming three quarters of a percent so the overall wage inflation is three percent right now there is another component on top of that, and it varies by uh, service for each individual active member, depending on where they are in their career. Um, and those are merit or longevity and promotion increases. So, um, and we use wage inflation to project member salaries, active member salaries. And then that results also in projecting the salaries which go into calculating the retirement benefits. So that's where it will have a bigger impact. Um, on the liabilities of the plan is how it affects with how it affects the wage inflation. What we're Thank showing, you. Okay, so the wage inflation uh, data here on the left hand side is what I was talking about is the local governments. We're seeing over the last five years that wage inflation has been as high as 4.8%. Um, and these numbers are largely driven by the inflation that's been happening in the country over the last couple of years. So we are seeing a direct impact um, on members' salaries and on people's salaries nationwide. Um, for your system, we also take into account the actual bargained agreements and increases when they are available. And these are used um, for the wage inflation assumption in the respective years. So the current uh, bargained agreements for uh, fiscal year in 2023, um, there's nothing currently agreed for with the police. They're currently under negotiations. Um, and currently for the fire, it's a 3% uh, uh, bargained agreement. So we are proposing an increase to this wage inflation assumption from 3% to 3.25%. Uh, and to continue uh, reflecting those bargain agreements when they're available. So that quarter percent increase is just directly from the inflation increase. We're suggesting keeping the real wage growth component the same. So it's really because we're recommending the increase in price inflation that right. drives that. Right. So lastly, uh, the last assumption before uh, I turn it over to Bill is the amortization payment increase rate. This rate impacts how UAL payment levels are calculated. It does not impact the period or the number of years that in which the uh, layer is paid. Um, it, that growth rate currently is set at the price inflation at 2.25%. The payments are developed and um, calculated as a const in constant real dollars. They're not level dollars, but they're constant dollars. So as a percentage of total payroll, they are expected to gradually decrease because the total payroll is expected to increase at a faster rate than these payments. So we are uh, recommending that we maintain this connection to price inflation and we are we, uh, recommending that we increase the rate from 2.25% to 2.50%. With that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Okay, I'm going to uh, start the discount rate discussion. I think everyone on the board is aware that this is the most powerful assumption in our valuation. Uh, if we have a higher expected return, it reduces contributions in the short term. Over time, uh, it depends on what actual returns are, not what we expect. So the idea really is to get the expectation right so that we uh, get contributions at the right level and they don't increase or decrease over time uh, due to this assumption. We do look at some historical experience and some surveyed 
data, uh, but that's really just to set the context for it. Uh, we really want to focus on what the expectations are going forward. And um, there, there's a range. And so where you end up in that range really should reflect uh, your assessments and preferences on, on how much risk to take. Uh, looking historically here, we're showing the, the blue bars are the uh, returns on the market value of assets and the green are the returns on the actuarial value where we smooth the market returns over five years. Uh, and then the red line shows the assumed return or the discount rate uh, for the, the period. Uh, there's a couple things uh, to note on this. One is uh, how good of a year 2021 was, uh, both compared to historically for the plan and just compared to our assumptions. Uh, the other thing I would note is really there's only uh, uh, three years where the return on the actuarial value was above the assumption. And uh, that was back in 2014, 2015, we were right on target, but then 2021 and again this year, the return on the actuarial value was about 8% because we're recognizing another piece of the 2021 returns in, in that smoothing. So even though we had a loss on the market value on the actuarial value, uh, we actually had a gain. Looking at the California survey, you see historically uh, we started uh, reducing our discount rate, really got ahead of the other California systems in, in reducing the discount rate when interest rates were coming down and uh, capital market assumptions were coming down. We're still uh, among the uh, lower discount rates uh, in the state. Uh, but we're no longer the lowest. And so the chart on the right shows the distribution uh, from the 2021 valuations. And you can see that most systems were at seven or six and three quarters. We're slightly below that at six and five eighths, but there are now four systems uh, that are, are below that. One of the other things we look at uh, each year is the expected risk premium, which is the difference between our expected return and the yield on a 10-year treasury. And as interest rates have declined over the years, that expected risk premium has really grown and, um, and really reached its peak around 2020 when the yield on the 10-year treasury dropped all the way to 0.7%. The yield on the 10-year treasury has bounced back. It's uh, This is as of June, it was 3.1. I think if you look today, it's uh, close to 3.8. It's bouncing around um, a fair amount, but it has come up substantially with the Fed increasing interest rates. That uh, going forward has an effect on the expected risk premium and makes it much easier uh, to achieve the expected return uh, if things stay in, in that uh, mode. Bill, quick question. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Uh, in the slides, you use two phrases interchangeably and for the board, I'd appreciate it if you would explain their relationship. One is the expected rate of return, and the other is discount rate. Um, the expected rate of return is the rate we expect to earn on our assets. The discount rate is how we discount the value of our liabilities to present value. If you would just somewhere in here explain to the board why those two are being used interchangeably. Yes. Uh, so in our funding model, we're trying to accumulate assets uh, to equal the liabilities. And, and uh, 
So uh, on an ongoing basis, then, if you make the discount rate for the liabilities the same as the expected return on assets, uh, it matches up and develops the smooth pattern, relatively smooth pattern of contributions to accumulate assets to pay the benefits. For other purposes, you could use a different discount rate for liabilities, um, you know, particularly if you were trying to price the annuities or look at some other, um, other metrics. But for the purposes of our funding valuation and funding the plan, uh, we use the same discount rate as the expected return uh, so that the uh, assets then are expected to accumulate to the same amount uh, as the liabilities and pay the benefits. Every year uh, when we're looking at this, we get capital market assumptions from Makita. Uh, they're applied to your uh, target asset allocation. And here we are just looking at the pension portfolio. Next month, we'll come back with information on the OPEB portfolio. Uh, we also pull information from uh, the Horizon survey, which has uh, 40 different investment consultants in it. And so we pull the average uh, assumptions from that survey. Uh, there are only 24 that provide a 20 year time frame, but that gives us a sense um, or, or gives us some verification that Makita, your investment consultant, isn't some sort of outlier among investment consultants. And Makita is included in that survey. Uh, so you can see here over a 10 year time frame, uh, the Horizon Survey and Makita were very close based on Makita's original assumptions for 2022. So I should back up here. Uh, most investment consulting firms issue assumptions on a calendar year basis uh, based on the markets somewhere around the end of the year, sometime in December, and then issue their assumptions in January or sometimes February. Uh, so those assumptions I'm referring to as Makita's original assumptions for 2022. Market conditions changed significantly during 2022. And so some of the investment firms, including Makita, have issued interim assumptions. Uh, Makita's, I understand, were set mid-year, so they reflect market conditions around June 30th, which is our valuation date, uh, and, and reflect those market conditions. And so one of the issues we're uh, dealing with here, as you will see on the 10 year time frame horizon, uh, we were looking at about a 6% expected return based on the original assumptions set at the beginning of the year. But the revised assumptions as of June 30th increased substantially to 7.3%. And over a 20 year time frame, we were looking at 6.8, 6.9 uh, at the beginning of the year. And on the, the interim assumptions, it increased all the way to 8%. So a really significant change that happened during that, that period. Now that is largely because that's when the Fed started increasing interest rates. So you have much higher interest rates. We also had the market decline. And so the price earnings ratios and valuations ha have declined. And so that changes the expectations going forward. Normally, um, this chart shows the, the range historically between Makita's 10-year uh, assumption is the bottom and 20-year assumption is the top. And the gold diamond is uh, what we selected as our expected return or, or discount rate. Uh, and you can see normally we want that uh, diamond to be somewhere between the 10 and 20 year return. About uh, 10 years, about 40% of the present value of benefits is paid out. 
20 years, about 70%, 50% comes in somewhere around uh, 12 to 14 years for the typical plan. So that's why we're looking at kind of between the 10 and 20 year expectations. But now look what's happened here uh, between the original assumptions and the interim assumptions. There's just a whole break uh, in what those uh, market assumptions are. Uh, we had a similar break for the 2019 assumptions where there was a sudden rise um, in interest rates and a drop in the market, and that reversed itself the next year. Uh, so we are uh, looking at this, monitoring it, and in, uh, in, uh, hope, hoping, I guess, that we can uh, consider a much more positive outlook in the future. Uh, but we're not really at this point um, ready to jump fully onto the interim assumptions. Uh, we're concerned that those could reverse themselves very quickly in, in the uncertain markets. So right now we're suggesting uh, no change to the discount rate. The six and five eighths uh, remains reasonable. If we were looking at the original assumptions, uh, you could look at no change or potential decrease. Obviously, if we were looking at the interim assumptions, we'd be looking at some sort of increase in the assumptions. Um, but we're suggesting that you just hold it at the current discount rate and wait until next year and see if the market conditions uh, persist before considering any sort of increase to the discount rate. Uh, but question. So any questions on that or? Yeah. So um, is this in is this interim sort of uh, dramatic difference mainly because equity risk premiums are in, are more sticky, and interest rates are you know more dynamic in the assumption making. Uh, well, we'd have to have Makita weigh in on the details behind their capital market assumptions, but. Uh, my my general understanding is you you have the rise in interest rates has affected the um, expected return in fixed income and and some of the other asset classes and then we've had significant drops in the in the valuations for other asset classes, which makes the outlook going forward more positive for those asset classes. Is Mikita on this call or no? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's Ishwar. Uh, so, yeah, Ishwar. Yeah, I believe that's what I've observed uh, is that I think that the base risk-free rate is the biggest determinant in terms of these changes. The equity risk premium doesn't change as much. Um, but shouldn't we uh, think about that um, at this time when, when we are trying to decide the discount rate? Because it, as Harvey always points out but correctly so that the, we are using the exp expected return to inform our discount rate, but the ex yeah. expected return isn't reflecting a new risk premium. Honestly, the interim numbers we should just ignore. Yeah, I think, and isn't that, uh, I think that's what Bill is saying is that because we just want to, you know, if to, next year uh, these numbers stay high, then I think we should revisit it. But at this point, uh, given that, you know, rates are higher because they're trying to, you know, tamp down inflation. Um, and inflation, those inflation expectations actually have come down quite a bit in the last few months. Um, so I would advocate what, you know, I think that's what you're saying and what Bill is also saying is that we make no changes now, but, uh, you know, we'll look, revisit it next year. Okay. Okay. And one other question on page 17. I guess I'm just trying to understand this. Is this the expected distribution of the, the 40 consultants or 24 consultants that were surveyed? The numbers on the right? The, uh, the column that says horizon survey uh -huh. is the distribution based on uh, the survey of 40 consultants. And then the, the columns under the Makita, the original and interim are the distribution uh, based on Makita's assumptions. So there are consultants who would 
basically say that their 10 year expectation is 0.3%. I mean, I'm just a bit taken aback by that number. No, 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 no. It, it's This is the uh, distribution of returns over 10 years at, at the fifth percentile. So given the, the expected return in the standard deviation, there's a 5% chance of oh. those assumptions uh, of an average return of 0.3%. Okay, so the survey is asked for an expected annual standard deviation. Uh, yes. Okay, now that makes sense. Thank you. But if you've seen the GMO projections, I don't know if you follow those, that may not be an, an abnormal data point. So. Well, what is GMO? Well, they, they, they've been very bearish on markets. And so their expectations of future returns have always been several standard deviations away from the normal, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, so there, I don't have it in front of me, but there, there is a, a range among the consultants of what their um, average expected return is. Uh, the survey puts it together by asset class and then uh, compiles an average uh, for each asset class. And so we've used the, the average for the asset class for these calculations. Okay, thank you. And, and Bill, a uh, silly question, but um, on the left-hand side, the percentile, that's how the survey is completed. Is that how Mikita does it? Or those, or those percentiles, uh, do they come from Archiron? The reason I'm asked is because obviously they are backwards from what we usually think about the returns and where the plans falls, right? If you're in the fifth percentile, you are in the top. These numbers are backwards from the standpoint that if you're in the fifth percentile, you're really at the bottom. Right. These are backwards from the way the investment consultants normally present it. These are just our calculations based on the expected return and the standard deviation. And so it just, uh, you know, plugs in a 95th percentile return is the, the top instead of the bottom. So compared to the way the investment consultants do it, the numbers would be flipped, but the meaning is the same. Uh, here yes. you have uh, a five percent chance of having a twelve point three percent return or higher. Well, understood. I just wanted to make the point, right? So I I I, I hear you and uh, appreciate the explanation. I just want everyone to understand that these are different from when we refer to usually the presentation by Mikita and Prabhu on the quarterly returns. And, the, and where does the plan fall in terms of percentile with the peers? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bill, uh, just a quick question. I, I totally understand that uh, this exercise is more of an art than a science in some sense. Um, yes. <clears throat> just a quick question on why do you, um, to survey consultants, do you include other, would you wanna include other market participants as well in the survey? like economists and such? Uh, it, it's getting access to consistent data. Um, and, and so we do some, a variety of things, but the horizon survey is something that is uh, compiled and has been referenced by the IRS and, and others. Um, so we are not opposed to looking at others if you have a um, a group that you would like us to look at, we're happy to do that and provide the comparison. Uh, our general view is we want to use your investment consultant who knows your portfolio the best. And our comparisons to others are really just to make sure that your investment consultant doesn't have an overly optimistic or overly pessimistic view compared to uh, others. So, so that's really where we're going with it. And, and Dave, just to clarify, I don't mean to speak for Laura. Uh, I think she is on the call. But generally, even among the consulting firms, it's uh, the, the forecasts come from the economists. And of course, economists have also predicted 10 of the last nine recessions. So just bear that in mind. <laughs>
Got it. Thank you. Bill, question. Are these numbers in, in the horizon survey uh, adjusted for our asset allocation? Yes, they okay. are. So let me jump ahead here. So, so this is really what we are using from the assumptions is uh, this is your asset allocation, the standard deviation. These are Makita's assumptions, but the standard deviation for each of those asset classes, and then the assumed 10-year, 20-year returns. And we do the same thing with the Horizon survey. There's just another set of these returns. And then uh, we do the calculation of both the arithmetic return and the geometric return. We use geometric returns uh, in our analysis. Um, so all these numbers reflect the compound return over a 10 year or 20 year time frame. Page 21 is worth pondering over for a second. Uh, looks like we really are, uh, there are only a couple of plants below us. It's San Diego. Yeah, so there were four plans below you in terms of the discount rate. Um, I have to pick them out here. The, the city of San Diego, San Diego Transit, San Mateo County. Who's the other one that I'm missing? Oh, Fresno County. Do we know, uh, do we have a sense of their funded status, these funds? Uh, we do. I don't have that um, right here. I know. So I know for San Diego Transit, they're lower than 60%, but they're also a very small plan and they're a closed plan to most participants. So their asset allocation is, is much more conservative. Um, and in San Diego City is also, they're, currently their plan, plan is closed to the general uh, group, but they're reopening it. But I do know that they also, <laughs> there's a whole, yeah, that's a- Yeah, you can say that. <laughs> yeah. Big ordeal, right? So yeah, so they're also more conservative. Um, uh, not that their asset allocation was much more conservative, but just because of the closed nature of the majority of the plan. So, um, and Fresno, I believe, is over 100% funded. No, no, it's this is city. Fresno is my oh own. city. Okay, yeah. uh, county. Okay, San Mateo is is very well funded, though. I think they're over 90% um, based on 2021 information. So, Bill, may, I'm going to ask you a controversial question, if I may. Okay. <laughs> is it is it reasonable for us to rely on the consultants' projections? Have have you ever done any back testing to see whether they're you know 20 years ago or 10 years ago their 10 and 20 year projections are any good? Uh, I haven't done any recent back testing. No. But. So, so Harvey, I, I have some information on that. Uh, in fact, Drew, Drew had asked me that question a few months ago, and we looked at uh, the forecasts that uh, based on Makita's uh, forward-looking returns. Uh -huh. uh, of course, for the federated plan because they've been the consultant for Fed for a longer period of time, and the actual returns actually came within something like thirty basis points or so of the forecasts. And it's a pretty high degree of accuracy. I would say. That, that's good. That's terrific. That answers the question, at least to that extent. I mean, because I think I think the, you know the board is trying to find a, a comfortable place in terms of projections and relying on. I think I think uh, Bill and Ann had a crystal ball depicted. And that's really what we're dealing with. We're dealing with funding people's lives, looking into a crystal ball. So the, the best reliability we can reach, I think, is what this board wants to hang 
its decision making. And, and and to your point, Harvey, about the uncertainty of these projections, it, that's part of the reason we show this this range because yeah. even using their assumptions, it, this is just the median outcome. There's a significant range around it that they acknowledge with the standard deviation, and so. Um, you know, there's built-in uncertainty in the expected return on assets. And, and, and does that require you to um, think about a, a margin for adverse deviation because of that uncertainty to work in a little bit of a cushion so that if we're wrong, it doesn't immediately hit the bottom line? Yeah, I think that's uh, something that we advocate consideration of always uh, with our clients. And that's really what we're talking about with the board's risk tolerance is uh, how much, you know, do you want to just go with the 50th uh, percentile or do you want some uh, margin uh, of conservatism or margin for adverse deviation uh, built in there? Um, so just to summarize, oh, sorry, one question, Bill, if I could ask, yeah. uh, is it fair to say because we're not making a change that we're, we're just like in, I guess, 2019, uh, are we, we basically staying with the original assumptions at, at the beginning of the year, as opposed to the interim, and we are going to, you know, we're not going to have our diamond up in the, you know, between 7.4 and 8.1, we're going to be, uh, Using the six to seven until further notice is that is that the way we did it also in 2019? I assume just go with the original assumptions until uh, some of the factors change where we have to make a change to the discount rate. Yeah, uh, that is what we're suggesting this year. In 2019, we had kind of the reverse situation uh, from this year in that uh, if they had reissued. Uh, assumptions as of June 30th, they would have been much lower in 2019. It was the beginning of the year that, that was high. Um, mm -hmm. But it's that volatility in the market. And what we don't want to do, for example, is to raise the discount rate this year and then realize next year we had we need to drop it back. And so um, we are suggesting that we think of it more in terms of the original and keep our gold diamond in the middle here of the original bar uh, and monitor things going forward. And of course, if market conditions stay uh, so that the capital market assumptions are higher, then next year we'll reconsider whether uh, an increase is appropriate. Okay. It, it remind me again, maybe this is not for you, Bill, but what, when, when would... Uh... When would the next readjustment occur? Uh, I guess on a what, what time? So of year? Makita will issue new capital market assumptions in January, and then we would be coming back at this time next year. Uh, and if Makita again issues interim assumptions, we'd also have that information uh, and, and bring it to the board for a decision that would be the June 30th, 2023 valuation, which would affect contributions for fiscal year ending 2025. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Sorry, Bill, I have another question. Sure. Uh, or for you, Anne. If by increasing the inflation and the amortization assumption and keeping the discount rate constant, you have a sense of what the unfunded liability the change in the unfunded liability would be? We do. <laughs> um, so we, we did some estimates based on the 2021 valuation, the census data and everything. So it's not going to be precise with what happens with 2022, but it should be uh, pretty close. And so if we increase, effectively, it's increasing the wage inflation assumption, uh, would add about $11 million to our actuarial liability uh, and drop 
our funded percentage by 0.15%. Um, combining that with the amortization payment increases, it has different effects on members and the city. Uh, members are in tier one are just paying a portion of the normal cost. Uh, that would cause their rates to go up by about 0.3% of pay. Uh, tier two, they're paying half of the normal cost and half of the UAL cost. Uh, it would cause their rates to go up by about 0.4% of pay. Uh, and for the city, it's about a, a 0.9 million dollar increase uh, to their contribution. So now, uh, in terms of the city, they were looking at uh, a contribution around 206 million which is down 6 million from the prior year. So this would um, bump it to, to around 207 million uh, roughly. Um, but uh, it's the member, uh, the member rates. I, I believe the tier two member rates are, I should have given you a baseline here of what these rates are. I don't have that in front of me. I don't know. And can you? Oh, this is good enough. Thanks. I, I forgot about this slide. Thanks. Yeah. The can you guys hear me? Yeah, now we can. Sorry, I did, it was quiet there for a while. Are you done, Bill? I am done. I would take questions. Uh, well, let me. This is our summary you... of what we're uh, suggesting, uh, but uh, certainly take questions and thoughts. But before you take questions, I'm going to take Chairman's prerogative, and I'm going to answer for this board a question that I get asked by my kids, my wife, my friends, you guys. Why in the hell am I still on this board 11 years later? Well, I'm a VC, man. Sometimes I'm with companies for, for 15 years for the exit. So I appreciate how important it is to have a long-term plan and stick to it. So I'm going to tell you, I put this in a memo, I think in June, I'll tell you again what the long arc is. So stay with so go back to February of 2012. I'm a new board member. I think it's my third or fourth board meeting. We're at an offsite at Hayes Mansion. It's a rainy February day. And Vince Sunzeri, who <laughs> was with this board until a year or two ago, gets up and posits something. So he's heard from the actuaries that, and Bill can go into detail about this, your plan is riskier than most. And what Bill said was, in any given economic downturn, because of the nature of how many active you have and how many retired you have, your city will feel more pain. Well, that makes sense. Okay, right? Bill's, you've all seen those charts where Bill says, in fact, you're like the riskiest I have ever seen. And so Vincent Zeri, 11, a little, 10 and a half years ago, goes, well, shoot, that means we got to dial down beta, right? That's what you do. But then Vince says, but let's remember that beta is essentially passive benchmarks. There's also alpha. And so Vince says, look, we should dial down beta and try to dial up alpha. Now, why does he say that? Because we're dealing with a world full of pretty stupid people who say, oh, well, the average plan has a 7% return. You only have 6.625. What are you, stupid? No, we have a lower beta. But Vince says, you know, if we're smart, and I swear to God, this is what he said, you know, if we're smart, we can marry a small alpha to the correct beta and deliver a return that's at the median of our peers. Let's break that apart into what Vince said. Now, this is the part where I contribute. I'm not a financial guy, right? I said, look, I, I, was, I was a professor at Stanford for many years, or lecturer, I did a PhD. And, and there's grading on, on a curve and grading absolute, right? 
And it's actually fair for all the morons out there to grade us on a curve. Oh, you're, lo you're less than seven, you suck, right? But we are fiduciaries, we must grade absolute. So we must set our beta to the right number. And there was an offsite at the Hayes Mansion three or four years ago, we picked the correct beta and you'll, we go through it every year, Varys did this, we picked the volatility at 12%. But it would be nice if we could also get a passing grade on the curve. So it'd be nice if we delivered the correct beta, 6.625%, but gave enough alpha to get us to 7%. So the first thing that Vince and I realized back in 2014 was, well, that's never going to happen unless we control um, the CEO and CIO positions. Well, you've heard of all that. That's measure G, right? And then measure G allows us to hire Prabhu. And it allows you know, Prabhu to build a staff re relatively independent. And so Prabhu was set the difficult task of Prabhu. Can you build a staff that consistently generates alpha? And the answer from Prabhu is, yeah, Drew, I, you know, 30, 40 basis points. Yeah, we can consistently do that. I talked to JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, where all my buddies are. I say, say how much alpha, profitable alpha beyond fees, are you generating for your billionaire clients? And they all say, well, pretty consistently 50 or 60 basis points of alpha. Okay, so Peru's not loopy, right? Other professional organizations do, can do, we can do it. All right, so Prabhu has in fact generated enough alpha over the last couple of years, and he's pretty confident, I'm, don't let me put words in your mouth, Prabhu, that he can do that ad infinitum for us to in fact raise our discount rate if we can rely on that alpha from 6.625 to 7%. If we can rely on that alpha, Prabhu says, well, Drew, if I'm here and I can, and my staff is here, you know, I think we can do that, Drew. And now we come full circle now to what the JPC is working on now, which is an incentive compensation plan. So Prabhu says, Drew, I think I can do that, but by God, man, you got to help me you got to help me stay here. You know, you got to help my guys stay in place. And so in six or seven or eight months, we're going to probably go to the city council and say, these guys are generating tens of millions of dollars of profitable alpha or in the odd case of the pandemic dip, hundreds of millions of dollars of profitable alpha. And if we give them a small piece of that, they will continue to do that. The basic Thing we're going to go, do is go to city council and say hey here's the thought how about you not kill the goose that laid the golden egg he's getting starving let's feed him some good grain and and the city council god bless your hearts may say no because essentially what we're arguing is to implement a capitalist system in the heart of a socialist system but we know from hogan you guys will see those results soon from the number one surveyor that there are lots of similar pension plans that have done this. It's not that loopy, right? You know, what we're suggesting um, may be a hard swallow for the city council, but, but other city councils have made that hard swallow. So the answer to the question that people ask me next, how long are you going to stay on this plan? Well, I might, I might exit the plan if we can't maintain alpha, right? Because then I will have done everything I could do. But if we can maintain alpha, I will stay with this plan until it's hundred percent fully funded. And then you can give me a, a, a gold watch and pat on the butt and send me out um, into my retirement as a happy warrior. Prabhu, am I putting words in your mouth or is that kind of the way you see it? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, well, I think, uh, well, Drew and I have had this conversation uh, you know, in terms of what is the alpha you should expect going forward, right? And I would say a competent investment team, uh, given our risk budget and our risk tolerance, should be able to add 30 basis points or thereabouts after fees and costs, right? So that's that goes directly to the bottom line. And, and of course, you know, one has to keep in mind that uh, it's not a consistent 35 basis points every year. But in the long run, we should be able to beat our benchmarks with 30 to 50 basis points. And that's the whole uh, you know, reason to have an investment office and an investment program. Uh, otherwise, you could run it 
with you know as a one man show with a consultant driven organization so i think i think that 30 35 basis points is very realistic i think some of the some of the better performing pension plans and other pools of capital do add that kind of value so I said the last meeting when Laura Warwick said, wow, you know, you, investment committee, Eshvar, Drew, uh, Vince, you guys generate like a billion dollars. So in fact, for, for Laura and I did have lunch with Vince to show him the chart. I, I will admit I was sitting right next to him, I had a little tear in his eye. But we also, through the course of lunch, asked Vince, you know, does he still stick to this beta plus alpha notion? And he does. So I, I think we can, Get an A graded absolute, six, six, a little over six, nine percent. And I think we can get an A graded on a curve if we can generate 30, 35 basis points of alpha pretty consistently and predictably. Then we can be at the median level of other plans, but take a lot less risk. And we saw, we saw that play out, guys. You saw what we did in the downturn, right? And we don't make as much on the highs, but correct me if I'm wrong, Prabhu, we sure lost a lot less than most plans did in this downturn, right? That's that's right, Drew. And that's that's by design, right? That goes back right. to the data study and our beta. Yeah. Right. So so you dial down beta and you, you don't get the highs, but you also don't get the lows. I mean, that's what that's what it that's what it is, right? It's basically a low pass filter. I'm a double A, I couldn't resist. Um so so we're probably within a year, well, hopefully less, because we want this in place, of actually asking the city council if they're willing to take some political risk to lock in an alpha, right? And everybody tells me, Drew, don't tell them you'll raise the discount rate if they, if they say yes. I think that's right. I think, Harvey, you said, Drew, that's a, that's a, you don't want to get in that kind of deal with them. But that is the reality of what would happen. Because we look at those Makita forecasts, and Peru says we'll add 30 basis points to all those, the discount rate goes up. That's just the reality of it. So sorry, that was a long-winded where are we in space and time. You guys put up a lot of drewness from me. Floor is open. Go ahead, ask questions of, of Prabhu or me or Bill. Floor is open. Hey, um. I just want to say that I, uh, as I thought more about it, I, I think that uh, we're being inconsistent if we don't consider an increase in the discount rate for the following reason. Um, one, when we voted on reducing the discount rate, we were in a very different interest rate regime. Uh, interest rates are finally, finally mean reverting. And um, even if the equity risk premium hasn't been adjusted in the interim, numbers of Makita. I think that, uh, and also given that we are on the very low end of most plans, um, I feel like we should consider an increase from uh, 6.625 this year and not wait until next year. So I would say, Sunita, if that's what you think, then go back to the investment committee and, and don't raise the discount rate, rate raise the volatility. Or say, at a vol of 12%, I want to keep it the same, I think the forecast return at that level of volatility will be higher than uh, 6.625. But the discount rate, to me, is made up of these subtending components. So get at the subtending components. But it is true that Makita and others, over the last three or four years since we set that volatility, have every year said your expected return is higher than 6.65. And in fact, if I have to look at, but almost every year, it seems to me they've been raising that forecast. And that's not in the face of a raised um, inflation rate because that would include um, 2019 and 2020. Does that make sense, Sunita? I mean, I go back to what Harvey was saying, that we're using the, the uh, expected return to inform our discount rate. And the expected return that we used last year was in a zero interest rate environment. Yeah. Or an, um, and we are normalizing. And I don't know, that part of it, I, I don't believe personally will change. Um, you may not have as high equity, risk, uh, equity returns. And actually, if you increase the discount rate, 
I know this is not supposed to be a consideration, but the unfunded liability will actually go down, right? Yeah, but quite a bit. Yeah, but I think, uh, you know, Sunita, Javi, can I go first? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, yeah. so, I mean, there are two different things, right? One is uh, we have an asset allocation and what is the return expected based on that asset allocation, right? Okay, and that's a different number than the six point six and five eights, right? Um, and to Javi's point, I mean, I'm sorry, to Drew's point, um, are we adding alpha? Uh, that should go off that asset allocation miss, mix and the expected return off that, because that's the value that the investment staff is adding in terms of manager selection. So we give, you know, we give an asset allocation um, and then the manager, you know, selection, they add alpha, right? So that's one thing. Now this, the, the discount rate at this point primarily is to determine the city's contribution to close the funding gap. And I would say that in the interest of stability, that we keep it at six and five eights, and you may be right. I think I actually agree with you that the interest rate regime going forward is probably gonna be higher than what we had in the previous 10 years. Uh, but I think in the interest of stability, I would say, Let's keep it at six and five eight. So the city's contribution are not, you know, like uh, reduced this year and then maybe increased again next year, um, and revisited next year. Because I think that's the primary use of this number from this exercise. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a reasonable point. But we have kept it constant for the last two years. Yeah, in a very different interest rate environment. I would I would add something else, Sunita. I I promised when I became chairman I would sort out what the appropriate discount rate for liabilities was, and it proved just to be too hard to do over Zoom with Bill and everybody else. But there's also the chance that we are way off on our discounting of our liabilities, and that also impacts the discount rate. That's until we know that. I'm sort of with Eshvar. I'm sort of somewhat loath to move that number until we know more. But, you know, you, this is a good debate. You're doing a good job debating it. You know, lead on, Sunita. So I know Cheryl's had her hand up for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Hey, you know, guys, I'm on my iPad. It's hard to see hands. Uh, Cheryl, go ahead. I, I just have a general question. I know that Harvey and Prabhu probably want to speak directly to the comments made by the other trustees, so I'll, I'll be very fast. Bill, when you were speaking of the $207 million contribution, is that the total city contribution for Tier 1 and Tier 2 for only pension, or does that include OPEB as well? That, that does not include OPEB. That was just for police and fire pension. Okay, but it does include tier one and tier two. So this would only increase the projected amounts that we saw in a previous meeting by, you know, about $1 million. Yes. Okay. And, you know, as the, as the board knows, these contributions are very important for the city's forecast. So the more information we have and the quicker uh, we get that information when decisions are made, it really helps us in terms of projecting and, and getting our, our budget forecast done. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. So yeah. let's do Harvey first, then Prabhu, then David Kwan. I'll keep my eyes on the hands. I figured out how to do it. Thanks. Um, following up on Sunita's comments, uh, Bill, could you go back to your slide seven? Because this kind of explains to me a little bit of the disconnect uh, that I've tried to suss out with um, the equivalence between the expected rate of return on our assets and the uh, uh, the growth of liabilities. The um, our our liabilities grow both for retired members and for active members. Our liabilities grow by that bar in the middle. You know, we're at three percent, right? The future liabilities are because because the wages are increasing by an inflation amount, and the cost of the benefits are going up, uh, or the the wages are increasing by the real wage group, and then the inflation rate is forcing up those liabilities in the future. 
So we grow our liabilities by inflation. So the our, as our assets, however, are the third stack. Our assets grow by inflation plus a real rate of return on top of it. And what Sunita's question came to me to point out is that our, we're expecting our real return to change. So our earnings rate might change because we're stacking inflation plus a real rate of return on top of that. And if our bond portfolio is growing now at a much higher rate, then our real rate of return is going up. But our liabilities are only going up by inflation. So, so Harvey, what do you mean the, by the liability? The liability, the benefits. In other words, somebody earning today a hundred thousand dollars and retiring today is going to expect uh, that their hundred thousand dollars is is going to be affected by cola, right? Some of our active members who are not going to retire for 20 years that we're also putting in projection of liabilities that they're earning, their final salary on which their pension is going to be based is going to grow by inflation, by wage inflation and price inflation. And so that's what those that liability for an active member today who may be in their fifth year when they return to retire 25 years from now, what we're projecting is what you're projecting is that when they retire, their salary will have gone up by inflation over a 20 year span. So that what we're projecting has to grow at inflation rate to project what that liability is going to be. But Sunita's pointing out that that is a very different number and growth rate than the rate of our assets. Our assets are going to grow by inflation plus a real rate of return. Am I, am I articulating that sufficiently, Sunita? And that perhaps- uh, Yeah, important. no, I mean, I'm actually a little bit, I, I've accepted that the plan has, has a policy where, or has been the practice, I don't know if it's policy or practice, that the discount rate for the liability is based on the expected return of the assets. I'm not. I'm sort of saying that's a given. And given that, I, I understand your point, which is if we are saying that the future payments are going up by 3% and we're keeping our asset returns constant, there's a little bit of a disconnect. Right. So let me just clarify. We use uh, the wage inflation to project the salaries and calculate the benefits and apply the 3% COLA and, and get that projected stream of future benefit payments. But for the liability reported in the valuation, each of those projected benefit payments is discounted back to the valuation date at the expected return on assets, the 6.625. So what, why is from one valuation why? to the next, if there were no benefit payments out and, and people didn't age or anything like that, you would expect the liability to grow by 6.625%. And you would expect the assets to grow by 6.625%. Then you put in the, you know, it, it differs a bit from that because, you know, investments don't actually earn 6.625% each year. But we also have the cash flows of contributions and, and benefit payments going out. And salaries aren't exactly 3% each year and there are different retirement rates and, and things like that so th that's what creates the the variation but fundamentally 
That's why the expected return and the discount rate match, because then both of them are expected to grow by 6.625 percent each year. Thank you. So, so think of it this way, Sunita. This is the exercise that I abandoned, but I'm going to pick up again when I'm no longer chairman. Bill and company forecast for 20, 30 years what we're going to pay out in benefits, right? And just like returns, that has two components, right? It has, well, there's inflation, right? And then there, there's real dollars. What, what, there's, what do we actually pay out and what do we pay out ex inflation? And nobody's ever answered the question. Bill, Bill and Ann know how to do it, but it's a lot of work. Over the last, say, 20 years, when we forecast those payments, were we right? I mean, nobody knows that. And there was that weird little thing we did back in the late teens where we set the COLA at 3% and then proceeded to move into an environment of, of about 2% per year inflation, right? And, and the thing I'm trying to ascertain, look, it's a political question. How much did the city's largesse in the late 90s cause us to be, in late uh, 20, yeah, late 90s cause us to be underfunded, right? The, the grand jury that looked into this asked that question. Nobody knows the answer, right? Even, right, Bill, I asked you, and you, I, if I'm paraphrasing, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, you said, Drew, that's hard work. We ought to roll up our sleeves and figure it out. So there is a real bill, really, right? You and Ann really forecast in year 2035, here's how big the checks are you're going to write, right? That's what all this is about, correct? Well, it, yeah, but what we do know is, is every year we track the gain or loss on the liability. And we track the gain or loss on the assets. And the gain or loss on the liability compared to our assumptions we're usually within about 1%. On the assets, the variation is a lot more than 1%. So well, that's, liability that's projections. Point, that's, a, that's a good point, Bill, but I'd love to know the answer of what was it relevant to what they said in 1995. No, I understand. <laughs> yeah, right. No, Bill's, Bill's right. I and mean, what Bill's saying is, you guys can trust me. I, I, Anna and I know what we're doing, right? But those yahoos back in 95 may have broken the model a bit. I also know something, guys, when you remember this, when Vince said he couldn't be there anymore, uh, Bill Hubby, I computed uh, how, how well um, Vince outperformed or underperformed discount rate. He basically hit the discount rate to within 10 basis points. So during at least our tenure, right, we are, we are delivering to discount rate. And as Bill says, during his tenure, we're watching liabilities correctly. I think Prabhu had his hand up. Go ahead, Prabhu, jump in, and then you, David. Okay. Well, just to make it more confusing, uh, I'll make the case for increasing the discount rate as well as decreasing the discount rate, and then you all get to make the <laughs> decision, right? So to, to, to Sin Sunita's point is right, right? I mean, we've kept the discount rate at six and five eights from a very different regime, where the tenure was actually yielding 80 or 90 basis points. And we're in a completely different world today. The tenure is yielding 3.7, 3.8, briefly, I think, jumped over 4%. So, and a dollar of assets is, you know, what we paid, you know, we paid a dollar in January, today we are paying 75 cents, right? So assets are also cheaper. So that is the case for perhaps considering increasing the discount rate. Now, the case for decreasing the discount rate is that if indeed, future returns are going to be higher. You want greater contributions to the plan. You want more assets into the plan and not fewer assets into the plan because this goes back to the POV discussion. Right? It's hard to time these things, but you don't want another billion dollars from the city when, you know, when asset prices are inflated. Right? You want it when they're discounted. And now city contributions are not the same as POB, but they are real dollars that actually get put into the system, right? So, so that's the case for sort of you know, uh, decreasing the discount rate. And, and the other thing I would add, uh, and also to, to Ishwar's point, you know, it may make sense to wait because we do have an inverted yield curve. So even though the tenure is high, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's relatively, you know, compared to last year, the, the short-term rates are even higher. So, 
the bond market and market participants in general expect inflation to be lower a few years from now, even though temporarily it's high. And, and I would go back to Drew's point, it may make sense, and this is an exercise that we've not done in the past, is to go back and say, you know, we, we talk about 30 basis points of alpha, and that's all within the context of a risk budget. And our risk budget, which is our active risk over and above, so there's the 12% risk that Veris has given us, and that's the beta that Drew referred to. But over and above that, we do map, and, and that's all based on passively managing our assets. But over and above that, we take a little bit more risk because we do have active management. And our risk budget has run pretty low over the last few years at about 1% or so. So if you think our, our I'm, I'm getting a little technical here. If you think our alpha is 30 basis points, our risk budget is 1%, our information ratio is, one, is, is 0.3. So we can revisit that and say, should that risk budget be 1% or could it be higher? Could we actually employ even more active management? And that of course comes with the trade-off that we would pay higher management fees and so on. But that's a question that we've not in the past fully answered or even explored. And, and that's something that we could do at the IC, uh, at future IC meetings. Well, and as, you, as you and I talked about probably over a year, a year ago, Prabhu, is, is should we change that per asset class, not across the whole portfolio, right? For instance, if you're doing a great job with the um, VC strategy, we could take on a lot more risk there because we're, we are getting access to the top managers. That, that's exactly right, yeah. yeah. All right, um, David Kwan, over to you. Yeah, just a short comment. Um, I, I might have stated this earlier. I, I totally understand that uh, you know, forecasting or estimating discount rate is more of an art than a science. And I guess I just want to express my thoughts as to why I'm comfortable with, you know, keeping the current discount rate at six, six and five eighths. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And and that's because I have a kind of a more of a naive uh, way of thinking about estimating expected returns. You know, I guess the starting point is um, estimating where interest rates are going to be. I know people use different interest rate numbers like. The, what the current short-term rate is, what the 10-year rate is. But, um, you know, to cut through the noise, I usually just look at what the Fed is indicating as what its long-term neutral rate is going to be, which, you know, they publish that uh, every quarter. And it's pretty much been consistent at 2.5%. So that's where they expect uh, in the long-term where interest rate, short-term interest rates going to be. Um, on, on the horizon. Obviously, interest rates can go down to zero. It can go above four, who, who knows, maybe by the end of the year. But, uh, you know, that fluctuation all evens out and they expect two and a half. And then I add on top of that interest rate assumption, a risk premium to the marketplace. And you could see on this page, you know, risk premium could be all over the map too. But I think, uh, Maybe if we can get, you know, people to kind of give us a good estimate of risk premium is, we can have a better sense of what the maybe um, uh, appropriate, you know, assumption should be. But my assumption historically, I've kind of always assigned to the market a risk premium about, you know, three and a half to 4% as something that's, you know, more doable. Uh, it, you know, that's, a, that's my range. And using those assumptions uh, from my point of view, I think it adds up to be, to be about six and a half thereabouts. And that's why I'm kind of comfortable with the six and five eighths assumption. Uh, certainly, I understand that this is an exercise where we can update the numbers on a periodic basis. And if these numbers drastically change, I think we're very, I'm very comfortable with, you know, the, um, uh, the consultants making these uh, changes to the recommendation going forward. So just, just a point of view. So um, before we go back to any hands, hey, hey, Bill, do you want us to vote on this this month? I thought we used to get to sit on this for a month before we voted. Uh, it, that's up to you. We do have uh, enough time built in the schedule for you to wait one month to, to vote on it if you're undecided. But if, uh, if the board's generally in agreement, the sooner we know, uh, the better. I, I, I'd like to postpone, she just raised a couple of really good points. I'd like to talk to 
Laura, uh, we're a committee uh, to both Makita and Barris, um, because you're 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 kind of right. I mean, I mean, those forecasts say we should exceed that number even over the well, especially in the long term. Um, I see uh, Eshvar, go jump in, Eshvar. Yeah, so uh, I, I do agree with David. I think um, the long-term expectations of both of inflation um, and the neutral rate, um, while they fluctuated a bit, um, have been reasonably well anchored through all of this. And the market kind of thinks the Fed is, uh, you know, is doing the right thing in terms of trying to bring inflation down and where things settle down at the end. So I agree with David. But the second is I just want to flag, uh, and this is not to start a new discussion, but there are two separate discussions here, right? Uh, one is the point the Sunita rate raised in terms of what the discount rate is. Uh, and the second is the point which Harvey raised, which is, you know, it's a discount rate for assets and liabilities should be different. And the latter point, I would say, is uh, it's a more involved topic. There's a lot of actually academic discussions on these. Uh, for people who are interested, you can just Google and you'll find uh, things you can read. Um, and it's not very clear. Uh, we do know that for corporate pension funds, uh, the rules are far more stringent. Uh, on the liability side, they're going to use a risk-free rate to discount it. And guess what? If we did that, uh, the city is going to be in a big hole in terms of the budget, right? Um, and But public pension funds, I believe, uh, and Bill can confirm this, uh, use the practice that we do, which is to use the same discount rate uh, for the assets and liabilities. Uh, that's not to say that is the correct thing, uh, but that's what we have done. That's what most people seem to use. And I think any changes to that, I, I think, is a much lengthier long-term discussion. So I just want to flag there are two separate discussions going on here. Well, well, that's right, Eshvar. And, and the proposal that I had to understand discount rate, understand uh, liabilities, and if they needed, was actually at a fudge factor. So we would discount them at the same thing. But we might say, well, our chosen discount rate is 6.625. But we've consistently under forecast liabilities, so subtract one eighth and set your discount rate six point five. Because Bill says we can certainly discount your liabilities back to different rate, but we're back now to grading on a curve, grading absolute. And I think the more we do things the same way everybody else does, but mathematically you can see if you can just apply a fudge factor, that would work fine based on history. All right, anybody else? Any more questions? Um, this is Laura. Can I mention something? Sorry, I missed the Laura, you're there. I'm here. I had stepped away for a second. Apologies. Um, on this topic, I was going to mention, you know, when we look at the total return on assets, it is higher now, um, our expectation than it was at the beginning of the year, just given the way that markets have behaved thus far this year. Um, but typically, if you recall, when we look at the expected return on assets, you're, you're expecting that half the time your actual return is going to be lower than that and half the time above. So most folks are really comfortable with the, with a higher probability than 50% of hitting your, your discount rate. Um, and across our client base, we were just talking about this as a broad consulting group the other day. Um, we're not seeing movement this year um, thus far on, on discount rates. Um, I think, uh, you know, one, one large state plan CIO said, I'm going to advise the board to lower or to to raise the rate as quickly as they lowered it, which is about five or 10 years of discussion <laughs> later. Um, and I think so folks that already have a higher expected rate um, generally aren't looking at lowering it given the new um, sort of return environment and expectations long-term, but those folks that already have a lower one generally aren't going up at this point in time. Well, I would recommend to the board, unless somebody wants to move, we do it now. I'd like another month. I'd like to meet with um, uh, Makita and Barris and think through what, what you're saying, Sunita. Um, and I can't do it in real time. I was almost convinced by Prabhu and Ishwar's comments. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, one thing I wanted to ask the board, uh, to board. <laughs> one of the things I wanted to ask the board to consider for the benefit of the entire board is if there's any sort of information that you would like uh, gathered and presented to you at the next board meeting that you think is not currently presided presented here that may help you under, uh, understand and make a decision? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I just need time to digest it. Anybody else want to ask uh, Bill or Makita to prepare anything else? Yeah, I, I, I do. I might sort of suggest one more thing that uh, to, to piggyback on what Ishwar said. I think there's a third topic, which is um, as a plan, 
uh, our discount rate, we want, we also have a diff we have this notion of having stability from the city, which I think is a, is a very good objective. Um, so, but that, as a result, we weighing on this number every year, um, is it necessary for us to weigh in on the liability discount rate every year if, we, if our objective is stability? And the second question related to that is, uh, given our funded status, I mean, our incentive is not to, um, you know, increase or to increase this rate from six and uh, five eights. But you know, how do we weigh that against the the process we have now, which is essentially it's based on expected asset returns. Maybe there's a different way of thinking about liability uh, discounting. I'm not suggesting this shouldn't be an input, but there are other inputs which are which we are sort of not necessarily. Uh, have any um, sort of guidelines around whether it's eighty percent funded, then we shouldn't move it. We should be in this range, you know, something like that. Well, it's very interesting you ask that question. One of the things um, that I've asked Prabhu to do and I've talked to Ruta about is I'd like to know when the present, say, decade, is two sigma off the past. It turns out. Sunita, one of the reasons we lowered our discount rate was we were one of the first pension plans, God, even before I got here to say, you know what, there's something screwy going on um, with the inflation rate. And, and across all these metrics, there's ways to know that the present and therefore the future is deviating from the past. And that to me is the biggest argument that says we really should look at this every year. Because you're right, if, 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 the, if the past predicts the future, then you lock on to volatility and you just stay there forever. And maybe add more or less staff to generate more or less alpha. But we saw, and you're old enough to have seen, that inflation in the 90s and then early 2000s and up until almost present had done something. Well, look, I'm an old man and I never saw this before. And you look at the history going back to the 1890s and we've never seen anything like this before. So there is that argument that says that, you know, um, the future doesn't match the present, but it rhymes. It's up to us to figure out where it's the same or it's different. Does that make sense? That's kind of how I think yeah. about it. All right, any more hands up? Drew, just a quick question to, sure. to Bill. Bill, yeah. this board has had in the past approved a rate that provides a higher than the 50% uh, probability, right? They, they have done that. Yes, they have. Okay. They, they've uh, generally tried to do that to be, uh, you know, no, have a rate that's no higher than the 50th percentile. Yeah, yeah, we used to have, have knockdown drag outs, Rito. You probably were there between Vince and me. And Vince finally convinced me when he just said, look, we're underfunded, so let's, you know, bet a little more conservatively. And that carried the day. It's often somewhere in the 50 to 55 percent probability range, is what yeah. we see. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so if that's the case. Yeah. Um and and on Prabhu's, Prabhu's hand, so he'll oh, take Prabhu, care of it. Jump in. Anybody just jump in, Prabhu. Oh, sorry, I don't. I don't see yeah. my hand up. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Roberto, stop messing with Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> Just give All him right. a chance and see what he does. <laughs> any more? Any more questions? Uh, let's let's uh, pick up. Let's pick up next month. I would like time to really digest what was said. If that's okay with everybody. And, and can I throw one suggestion in here? Please. Longer yeah. term, uh, we keep having a discussion about whether we should be using the expected return to discount the liabilities and what the corporate sector does and, and other things. That's really a much longer conversation oh, yeah. uh, and would be a great topic for a retreat or a, a separate uh, sort of presentation than, than what we're doing here because it really does involve some uh, it bringing in a lot of uh, other information. There's the academic, papers. There's also a bunch of material from the uh, Academy of Actuaries on it and, and and how the different models work and what the implications are. So I'd suggest 
um, that we park that particular discussion for a oh. retreat and, yeah. and uh, a longer discussion um, so that we can really get into it and, and look at the different points of view. I think that's a great idea, Bill. Let's get this look back from say 25 or 30 years first so we can say, well, this is what actually happened. Because then we could take that, I think, as a case study in, in how we should think about it. Makes sense? Uh, I mean, sure, sure, we can blend the 25 to 30 year history with the discussion on the, the liability discount rate, but um, yeah. they're really kind of separate topics. Yeah. Just, just so you guys know, God, it's been, I, how long you've been working with this now, Bill? A decade? You came on, I think, right, right about the time I did. Yeah, so just Bill, Bill has not only been saying you're the riskiest plan for 10 years, Bill's also been saying for 10 years, you know, you should think of liabilities separately from assets. I think I'm going to put words in your mouth. And that's part of what you're saying again now, right, Bill? Well, yes, you should think about them separately, but there are different reasons for using different discount rates and so you yeah. need to yeah. understand why you know what you're uh using it for and, and why and how that all fits in great all right let's go ahead this was a great discussion um, um i got pinged by maytag and harvey we're going to bump uh 4h to next month this has been a busy meeting but but next month should be quieter so, uh, let me turn 4F and 4G over to you. Uh, do, Bill, do you you don't need a decision on the on the uh, inflation or anything like that right now? I I think uh, we're going to defer the decision to next month. And okay. So that people can contemplate. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any additional information we've been asked to no. bring back, but if there is, uh, you know, let us know in the interim and we can put it together. Yeah, okay. that's, uh, that, if you don't mind, mind, Bill, I want to take some time to digest this. We are living in interesting times. Oh, go, Roberto, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and it's hard. Usually it's really easy and exciting to go right after Bill's presentation. Not today, though, because it was very entertaining and exciting and a lot of discussion. So I'm going to try my best. Uh, regarding 4F, um, in, in terms of the disability retirement process, um, this particular discussion actually deals with the role of the board medical advisor. You may recall that uh, about two years ago, we, we came forward with the result of an RFP uh, where we were quite lucky and surprised that we found uh, one alternative uh, for board medical advisor. And uh, that, that was WHS, uh, which we ended up contracting with. That was almost a year and a half or two years ago. And um, I have kept the board apprised to some extent on the onboarding and how the transition has taken place. And I think I also mentioned that we were having some uh, uh, challenges through that process. And uh, I was going to come uh, later in front of the board with the recommendations. So this is where we are. Um, if, if staff can actually call the, the memo to the screen, I'm not going to go through the memo uh, in detail, uh, but you can see in, 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 in the memo, the analysis and also the, the recommendations. We actually have had some challenges with um, onboarding, not only WHS, uh, but have been actually disappointed with uh, their, their work and uh, the inefficiency, not only from the administrative standpoint, which is part of their contract, but really also the work associated with the medical analysis, uh, to the extent that obviously over time, the, uh, the, the backlog of the uh, disability applications have actually increased. Um, the memo, I, I do want to make a side point here. Uh, I know I think Cheryl is still uh, at the meeting. The memo does actually makes a reference to the municipal code, 
um, you all realize that the San Jose Municipal Code right now, uh, as, it, as it stands, is not the process that we are following. <laughs> the process that the code actually called for was the process that was agreed to by the unions and the city a few years back, where they were gonna be taking the decision make it from the boards to a three board medical panel. That never came to fruition because we, we as in ORS went out twice to the market, if not three times, and the city did it once and they were not, we could not find any vendors that actually met the requirements. So I just want to kind of, I think, park that to the side right now that the code as it reads right now is not what we are working on. What we have on the disability application process is what we have had for years, which is we use a board medical advisor we have a committee that listens to the applications and the applicants, and then those applications come to your board. Um, the, free, the straightforward recommendation to you here, uh, this, well, it was this morning and this is afternoon, uh, we think um, because of our uh, relationship and the uh, results of working with WHS, and quite honestly, uh, the disappointment on, on the results, uh, we are recommending that we eliminate the board medical advisor role from the application process. Um, in addition, we would like to also the board support on, on contracting with exam works uh, to include disability application processing services. Uh, if your board is actually in support of these recommendations, certainly we will try a very, a, very reasonable transition between WHS and, and, and exam words uh, for, for that service. Uh, in, in terms of the specific recommendation for the board medical advisor, is, is actually twofold. Uh, the first one is, um, I think I have shared with you before that I actually come from other systems in California where the disability process was actually worked through committees and the boards without a board medical advisor and based on IMEs, independent medical examinations reports. And that have worked very well over, over time. And in fact, that is uh, the standard process of our peers across the state. Uh, second, um, we have had a very difficult time in the past when we go out to request services for board medical advisor. So when you actually entertain uh, those two uh, situations or issues, um, actually it, it makes sense to then uh, consider eliminating the board medical advisor role from the disability application process. So uh, in closing and in summary, uh, we would like you support on, on those two recommendations. And again, um, I'm, I'm assuming that you have read the, uh, the, uh, the memo and all the documents that have been uh, included. Uh, staff and myself stand ready to address any specific issues or questions you may have on this issue. Thank you. Uh, Floor is open. Mr. Chair, I'm Dick yeah. Santos and I'm here with retiree President yeah. Ray Storms. Uh, if you can hook, put the whole memo there a little more than I, we can see it. Of course, many things come to our mind. But before I uh, say any more, let me get uh, President Storms on, on the air here. Go ahead, Ray. Hello again. Yeah, um, I did have some questions. One of which, getting rid of the medical board advisor, when I look, because I go to the committee, I see the committee, I've been going to it for years, the panel. Um, that's one less person on there. But the problem I have with getting rid of, rid of the medical board advisor is, he can answer questions in disagreements on the medical, the IME or the community or whatever they're doing. You have somebody that, that the retiree's attorney can ask questions of. Without him there, if all we have is the IME, are we gonna have a representative from the IME there to discuss his 
I am E. Does that make sense? Because if we don't, if we have to have somebody to, to look at it, to review it, and then discuss it and say yay or nay. I know it's the panel, the five panel, but we need somebody there to discuss the issues. Without that board, that medical advisor, there's nobody there actually at the meeting. That, that's my concern. And the other concern is, is it a conflict of interest putting all of that all in with um, exam? Is there a conflict of interest there? Well, like, so putting them together? Let me let me address that. And and again, uh, first of all, the IMEs they are independent medical examiners, right? So they're independent. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, if we do contract with Sam Works, uh, we will have the IME available at the meeting, so the IME can actually address any questions from the applicant of his or her attorney. Um, and then, thirdly, as I said. Uh, in my introductory comments, uh, this is sort of the standard across the state. Uh, in many instances, you don't really have a third, well, I don't know if it's a third, but an actual board medical advisor uh, to examine the reports by the IME. Th that has been uh, the San Jose system because um, there was actually a department when there was an actual doctor that not only provide that service, but it, in fact, actually examine the applicants. And that happened for many, many years until a couple of years ago when the city actually uh, um, went away from that approach and actually deleted that department. We were just quite lucky, Ray, that the board medical advisor that we were able to contract was, was actually the city doctor before Dr. Das, uh, which, you know, I thought she did excellent work. Uh, but, you know, going back and, and looking at, at where we are today, uh, the challenge of uh, actually finding um, vendors that could actually meet the requirements to be the more board medical advisor. And with the challenges that we have encountered with WHS, um, and the disappointment of the services, we think is the more appropriate way to go. How much of a backlog has WHS created? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to blame it on WHS um, completely from the standpoint that there was a backlog to begin with, right? Before they joined us, it has increased uh, to some extent um, I do have some numbers, uh, Sandra, I don't know if you, I mean, I don't know that we need to get into the specific numbers, but I'm uh, going to guess, uh, if I'm mistaken, please correct me. I'm going to guess that uh, the backlog may have increased, I'm going to educate a guess about at least 20% from before. And so that's actually a consideration. Uh, now, I, I do want to say and this is something that we have to work on staff with you board. Some, I don't know to what extent, and maybe Sandra can comment on these numbers. Some of this backlog is actually created, some of it, by members that somehow through the process defer the application meaning they actually got to the point where they, they actually went to the IME and when the information that was provided was uh, not so much, or wasn't that clear, or wasn't that positive, they sort of delayed the process and stopped mm -hmm. the process. And so it's really on us as a staff to recommend to your board that those kind of cases be given a timeline uh, for the lack of a better word, I'm going to say six months. And if they don't move forward, then we just take them out of the backlog. And if they want to uh, apply for the disability, again, they will have to do it uh, from the beginning. Uh, so some of that backlog it, it is impacted by those numbers. Uh, Sandra, do you have any, any other comments uh, besides uh, in addition to those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have, I think, in those that bucket you were talking about, Roberto, we have 13 that we refer to as deferred in that the applicant has placed the application on hold for their reasons and, and has not followed up 
um, to continue. We, and I, in terms of the backlog, it looks generally like we, and I would say because in since we started with Work Health Solutions, they have completed one application for us um, in that time. So they've done one. I think in that time, we've probably got about 10 new ones, 10 or 11 new applications. So the backlog increased that net gain of about nine or 10 during that time. So numbers might not be exactly right, but I think that gives you a general idea. We're not keeping up with at least the new ones that are coming in right now. How many are on the how many total applications do we have right now pending? Right now pending, we have Work Health Solutions has as 31 right now. And then we have a hundred that we have not that we have not given to Work Health Solutions that when they're ready for more, we will start chipping away with. And then obviously at the same time, we have new ones coming in every month. So including Work Health Solutions, a little over 130. Here's my concern. Okay. I want to talk from a personal perspective. Mine took four years to get through. Okay. One year was a mistake by Dr. Doss because he thought he'd completed mine, but he hadn't. The problem I'm seeing now is I have people that are six, seven, eight years, and they're like, they can't get on with their life. And it, I, if, if you've never been through this process, you don't understand. Your life is on hold because you have doctor's appointments, I am this, that, me, and you can't move on. I, when it got to the point of my, my four years, I almost gave up, I almost said, just forget it. That's how disgusted I was with the system. And now I hear, and back then we had 125 people on the log. I just talked to a gentleman yesterday. I forget what you call, what you term when they're out of time, when they're, when they're no longer drawing funds. He's on his own, doesn't have insurance, and he doesn't have a pension. Those people need to be taken care of. We're doing a disservice by not getting them through the system. Whether he gets it or not, it's indifferent. He needs to be put through the system. How many so, of those do we have right now currently? I forget what the what they call 48 what or 4850. 48, 48, How many 4850 so, do we have? So so Ray, this is this is Drew. I think what you're hearing from Roberto is a, a plan to fix that. I think look, when we when Dick and I redesigned disability system, we streamlined it. And then the city came in and said, here, do something impossible, right? And I think what Roberto is saying is, look, it's, it's time we, we knuckled down, right, Roberto, and fix this. I think this is the proposal to fix it. Am I wrong, Roberto? That's, that's certainly part of it. And you are correct, Ray. But let me just add, you raised an issue um, about this gentleman. We do try very hard uh, when there's a financial hardship to bring those items up front. So if the member has a financial hardship because they're not collecting, right? I mean, they may be able to somehow survive from their spouse or someone else, but if they have a financial hardship, we will put that on front. One of the challenges has been that this whole process and work with WHS has not worked as expected. And so it's increasing the backlog. And this is, you know, I, as, as Trustee Lanza indicated, um, eliminating the board medical advisor mm -hmm. uh, role from the process is gonna have a, a huge impact. But by no means, it means that the ba backlog is gonna go down in six months or a year, but it will go a long way on making sure that we can uh, start getting that backlog uh, down. In, in your reference to the six or seven years, you're absolutely right. I, I have spoken to staff and I know Sandra is there, Barbara is there. Um, and there's no reason why an application should take more than two or three years, uh, except for a very, very specific situation, right? Uh, so um, what I have found over time that when there are six, seven years, um, Ray, and, and this is one of the issues that I encountered when I first uh, came to work for the boards and the members 10 years ago was in my experience in my other jobs when you file for disability many times as you well know especially in the police and fire side members have different parts of the body that they file disability for right well I, I was trying to streamline the process and say listen you may have neck you may have ankle you may have back you may have a knee you need to choose one, let's just move on. Well, they wouldn't do that. They would just keep five, six, seven, 
and they needed to go through all of them, CIMEs for all of them, and get MMA for all of them before the process, the, the, the process can continue. But that had an impact. I don't know that it will have a six, seven year impact, but it certainly impacted the backlog. So that's another thing that I've been trying to do. Sometimes you have different parts, but you go to see your doctors, you have an idea which of those areas, or well, at least keep it to one or two that are the most relevant one, so you can keep up the process and finalize it as soon as possible. Um, I mean, it is on us to make sure that the process is clear and can help the members. But I can tell you from my beginning 10 years ago, that was one of the biggest reasons why it took so long for a particular application. It was because it wouldn't come to the committee until they, all the specific areas that they filed for were actually reviewed. Roberto, this is Dick, and as the chair here, I'm sitting with Ray, and I see some other hands up, but just hold one. Drew, uh, weigh in on this, because uh, Drew and I worked very hard on this when nobody wanted to take this on years ago. So Drew really did a hell of a job, and as you remember, he volunteered his time to make sure the caseload wouldn't be behind. So here we are today, very successful with Dr. Chairman. So why is the changes? We're blessed to have Rush Raketa because he has so much experience, and I'm very, very happy with that. And with Drew us together, we've made this streamline, and things are working well. You got to remember now: Are you? Are we going to do something new without a medical doctor being there? Because I have concerns about these sensitive areas. Now, Drew knows where I'm going. You police officers and firefighters know where I'm going. We got some mental issues, and we have some real touchy, sensitive areas. You've got to have a doctor there to be able to answer those things in closed session before we vote. It's a very sensitive area. I hope it doesn't increase, of course. So with Russ's experience and Drew's experience and mine, we're able to handle these things because of our medical knowledge and the experience that we've had, especially Russ. But when it comes to an iffy situation, it's sure nice to have the professional there to follow up to make our minds clear when we rule on medical evidence only. So to me, the system we have has been working, it's not broken. I wanna keep it going and I'll yield the floor. So, so hang on though, but Roberto, didn't I hear you say that under this new pro system, there will be somebody, a doctor on the call, didn't you say that? That's Correct. I mean. The IME that writes the analysis for you committee and the board will be on the call or at the meeting, yes. Yeah, I think, I think Dick, so I think you're right, Dick. We got very unlucky when Susan Tierman retired and, and Raj Das is getting it done. So we're still gonna have somebody there. It's gonna be an IME. And Roberto, I guess then the question that, that Dick's kind of raising is, will we continue looking in the background to find another Susan Tierman? No, I mean, that's, that's the whole reason for this Recommendation is one you bore, if, if your board does ap agree with the recommendation, we will change the process to actually uh, get away from the board medical advisor. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be receiving a, a medical analysis. It, you're just going to be relying on the IME analysis, uh, not on an IME and then a subsequent board medical advisor analysis. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, uh, so Dick, I mean, uh, Dick and Ray, we're going to have somebody there, uh, but it's going to be an IME. I mean, remember, Dick, when we run brand for a couple of months in between Susan and Raj Das, the IME stuff was, the, the reports were pretty good. I, I was impressed with the reports. Uh, we don't know what will happen if they're report but plus in person. Are we talking we about cost or services? You know, services are really important. Cost is always an issue. But, you know, for me, when people give 25 and 30 years of their lives, and the rest of our lives is coming up for a judgment, it's important that we have the best medical people possible to make Drew and I understand the vote. Well, I think, I think uh, look, I'm gonna paraphrase. If you're watching this, Raj, I'll owe you beer, Raj, Dr. Raj Das. Susan Tierman was that person, but Raj Das is not. And, and part of the whole problem, right, you're saying, Roberto, it's really, really hard to find a Susan Tierman, if I read the <laughs> Yes, it is extremely hard. We were really lucky, extremely lucky to have the Tierman. You are correct on that. Yeah. Dr. Doss has experience. 
We work well together. If he has the opportunity, I know he can fill those shoes. I I I agree that he has experience, uh, Trustee Santos. I don't. I'm not suggesting that he does not. And in fact, I have had very difficult conversations uh, with him the last few days on this specific issue. Uh, the fact remains that we have been disappointed from uh, their services, including uh, the efficiencies, not only from the administrative part of the of WHS, but also the work uh, uh, from the medical analysis standpoint. Uh, it's just not moving. And I just, quite honestly, do not see an improvement going forward. And I'm just, you know, as I mentioned, your board and the committee has always worked under this process because the city had a, a medical director, right? Which he actually or she even examined the applicants. That is just not the norm uh, for the other systems. And they have worked really well. And I might add, um, I don't disagree with you, Dr. Uh, Trustee Santos, because I, I do know uh, Dr. Das does uh, good work. And uh, Dr. Chima was just uh, outstanding in her evaluations. But in, in most cases, in many cases, uh, they, these applications are pretty straightforward. There are not that many instances where you have to have that many discussions. Where well, I let, let me put in, when you have an independent medical, medical examiner, be when you have an independent medical examiner, that person doesn't necessarily know police and fire occupation. That's the biggest issue we have. Chairman does and so does Doc. And if we're going to give up cost for services, I got a concern. The, it should be. I, point well taken. I can guarantee you that we're not looking at this just as a difference between cost and service. This is not just cost related. Uh, I, I think this is an appropriate process. I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't think that it was an appropriate approach to be taken by our office and your board, but understood. I think, Dick, I think we're, what we all have come to realize is that we had a unicorn in, in Susan Tierman because Ray is saying, and we agree, Ray, well, you gotta process the volume. And you're saying, Dick, and we all agree, yeah, but you gotta have the personal touch. And only Dr. Tierman was able to give us both. I mean, D Raj Das will give us personal touch, but he can't handle the volume. And so, it, you know, I think the whole point the city made was go out and find a bunch of Susan Tiermans only they don't exist. I, th I think we were unusually lucky with Tierman is what Virgil's telling us. I see no reason to doubt that. Let's do this, Mr. Chair. I'll yield the floor to Mr. Wilson. Some others get the, their input. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me, uh, hey guys, hang on one second. Um, hey, let's take a comment or two, but Virgil, we have to break in a minute or two for the resetting of the uh, tape, right? Correct, at one o'clock. So I think if someone uh, has some comments, they have three more minutes and then we have to stop from one to one o five. Yeah, Dave, you've had your hand up forever. Go ahead, Dave. All right, mine will be quick anyway. Uh, first of all, I applaud uh, Roberto and, and staff for looking at this because obviously the members are suffering if you've got 130 backlog and uh, WHS has gotten to one. So that's an issue. Um, I'm okay with the IME process. I like it. It's it's what, uh, like uh, Roberta said, our peers are doing across the state. Uh, I read the memo and it seems like it's working well in other agencies. I'm good with that. The one question I have, and it may be for uh, council is, and I'm going off the top of my head on memory, so correct me if I'm wrong, please, but I believe the charter specified that we had to have a three doctor panel if we do something like this, does that violate it and open us up to anything? So you're correct that the uh, San Jose Municipal Charter does require us to have a three-member uh, medical panel. But the problem is, as Roberto alluded to earlier, is that we did try to RFP and bid that. It's a, it turned out to be an impossibility. So because it's an impossibility to satisfy the, the mandate of the statute, we, we are able to move forward because we do have a fiduciary duty to um, administer the benefits and process them in an expedient way. And Harvey has a hand Excellent. Up. Excellent. I agree with that. Uh, do we know what the city's position is on uh, this proposal? Uh, have they weighed in? Um, um, the proposal before you this, uh, this afternoon about uh, eliminating the role of the board medical advisor? Correct. And, and uh, no, not doing the three member. We, 
we do not know. And I was hoping that Cheryl will stay in the meeting so she could come in if she wanted to. But yeah, we do not know what the board, the city's position is on, on this issue. Okay, thanks. And uh, like I said, I'm all for the memo. I, I read it all the way through and uh, you have my support. Thanks, Roberto. Great. Uh, Harvey, can you get done in 30 seconds? Because we've got a break for the tape. Yeah, just a question for staff to confirm. Uh, there's been some discussion about the the uh, delay to members and that impact, and it certainly is impactful. But am I correct in understanding that while the disability application is pending, we are paying out the service benefit at the service retirement level? Isn't that correct? Well, I mean, it depends on the particular case, uh, uh, Council. If the member has retired, yes, and they are retired by service, correct. Uh, well, but pending if, their application, aren't we paying the service retirement if they're if, in retirement? Uh, yes. if, if they file for a service retirement, yes, we are. Hey, but I'm going to I'm going to exert. Let me exert privilege. Hey, let's take a break for five minutes, Roberto. I'm picking up where we left okay. off. My watch just being it's the hour. So okay, five minute you. break, everybody.
Uh, let's go ahead and get back to work. Uh, trustees, I know it's been a long meeting, but this is the last um, agenda item. After this, we'll just do AB 361 and then retirements and death notices. And I, I, I think there are no committee reports just receiving files. I'm sorry, Rick to Harvey, I cut you off. Why don't you get back to what you're- No, no, yeah, I wanted to get back to a council's question. Yes, you are correct. Uh, we do pay service retirements to members that file applications while their disability application is in process. That is correct, yes. Uh, floor is still open. Any other questions? Uh, Drew, I'll, I have a few comments. Yeah, sure. Jump in. So I, I completely understand and hear um, uh, what uh, Dick and Drew are saying about the, the, the value in the um, board medical advisor and what Dr. Tierman has provided, you know, in the past. Um, although I'm not on the committee, I've only sat through a handful of, you know, the committee's uh, disability committee meetings. Um, <clears throat> that was pre during pre COVID time. Um, and, and, I, and I sense the value there. Thinking back to the, R, the last RFP that we have come across. Um, actually, let's back up. I mean, there's, there's two, there's, there's two issues. I mean, one is, you know, the original, um, the, the original governor says we need a three panel doctor. We know that's not working out. The city has been working for years with the unions and trying to put multiple RFPs out to get this panel doctor and it's just not working. Um, and so in the meantime, we continue doing with what we're doing now. Uh, the hard part is the last, the last RFP that we did to replace Dr. Tierman, we only had three results back. Um, Dr. Doss's group, uh, and there was one out of state. There might have been two out. Both of them might have been out of state. One of them didn't have an idea of, you know, what the true work was going to be entailed in it. And so they really didn't qualify. The other one, it was sort of in the same boat, but then also they didn't want to attend the meetings in person. And so we were having more issues. Okay. What this is showing me is really we only had one candidate. There's not many people out there that do this type of work and so it's a it's, it's, if we if we go forward and try and do another rfp we're gonna have the same issue and in the meantime it's just going to put add a backlog of another six to eight months you know to you know the, the growing pile of people that are submitting files and those that are waiting um my understanding San Jose, or not San Jose, Fresno City has this, is, does the same process, and and it works really well for them. Um, I'm willing to I'm willing to try that out, uh, because the the one file that they have done over, I don't know, Sandra, when did they the contract go in effect? March, April, May. March. Okay. Late, late February. Yeah, late late February. Yeah, yeah, February. Yeah. So one file in six months. That's just not acceptable, and it's hurting. It's hurting our membership. Uh, we, we've heard from uh, Ray talking about the frustrations of the members that he hears on his side, and and we have to do something about that. Um, I know if I was a vendor and I got hired to do a job, my my best foot is going to go forward right away. I mean, I'm going to be throwing a lot of resources out to make a good first impression. Okay. This hasn't happened on two fronts. One, when the contract negotiation was going on, it sounds like that was dragged out longer than it should have. And then two, now that they're onboarded, they've only done one file. That's not acceptable. Um, our membership is hurting. And so we have to, we have to move on and, and find another solution. Um, if we have to go back to um, Dr. Doss's group multiple times to try and get corrections or trying to you know, get them to perform better, that's that's a red flag. Um, do I have concerns going forward about the more difficult cases that might come forward, especially around PTSD? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, are our cases a little bit different? You know, police and fire. You know, compared to federated, just because of our job descriptions. Absolutely. And you know, there's 
I know when I go see uh, workers comp doctors on at times they they have no idea what our job duties are and you know they'll put us to you know, either light duty or full duty not realizing what we actually do and so that's an important part and that's something that we're gonna have to maybe work with or work through um, as we go forward um i think at this point i mean staff works hand in hand with these people every single day um and we have to you know take in consideration you know their opinions on on what has been going on in the background dick and drew definitely knows more than i do because they're more intimate you know with you know with the day-to-day -day operations um but i i feel like we have to it, i feel like staying pat is only going to hurt our services and our members um i'm willing to go forward with with a recommendation here but it's, it's going to sort of be in the same recommendations that we had with dr Doss's group when we were voted on his contract that, hey, we're going to keep a close eye to it. And if there's if, if we don't think it's going smoothly or we find issues, then we're going to have to revisit, uh, revisit it. So um, at this Chair, point, yeah. I would like, would, would you would you let Rush Raketa say a couple of things because he had the experience in that. I would, I would appreciate his comments. Oh, yeah. Russ, are you online? I didn't see him, Dick. I am. He had his hand up several times. I'm oh, sorry. Russ, are you out there? We'll jump in, Russ. You're on mute, Russ. Russ Raketa, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> hey, um, Russ. Hi. Um, a, a couple of comments. Um, first, uh, the IME experience that um, uh, I have uh, participated in for the two city of Fresno systems has shown uh, a marked sensitivity by the various IME examiners to the police and fire context. I, I had the same concerns originally that board member Santos has expressed, but have, have found um, uh, those concerns to be unfounded in uh, the in the many, many cases, police and fire cases that I've seen there. Um, and it, in one sense, though, we don't want to be outcome determinative. Um, I've seen uh, some greater flexibility. I'll use that term in IME reports then in reports by the board's medical uh, advisor, um, including here at San Jose, just, just to mention that. I also do um, want to underscore the dimensions of the difficulties with WHS that I've encountered. I, I do not participate in the processing, the gathering of medical records. So I do not know, uh, do not have any concrete information or, or, or um, uh, advice or observations to offer. Though I, as well as you, can see the great lack of progress there and the lack of cases coming forward. I can only comment on the rather small number of reports that have come forward, either in draft or in final form. And, and I, I know they show a lot of Dr. Das's experience and knowledge, um, but I also cannot deny there have been significant um, issues of substance uh, with respect to several of, of those reports. Now we've only seen a handful and obviously it's a particular genre of report, perhaps I can say, and the more you do them, the more easy, uh, the more uh, accomplished you probably are in preparing those reports. So, so I can't discount the possibility that the quality of the reports may improve in the future. But as to the ones we've seen, there have been some surprisingly 
um, um, uh, elementary errors that that have have uh, uh, made those reports much less valuable than they otherwise would have been. I, I'm happy to answer any questions, particularly about the city of Fresno experience that anyone might have. Oh, and perhaps uh, Mr. Storms mentioned the possible conflict of interest situation with exam works. Uh, in a sense, I guess, visualizing that exam works may try to structure things to please the client that is paying it. I'm, I may be misinterpreting the conflict issue that Mr. Storms envisions, but I, to the degree I have phrased it correctly, I, I would just want to add that I have not seen any such conflict of interest. Um, the exam works, IMEs, that reports that I have seen focus on the medical evidence, solely on the medical evidence, and um, certainly do not routinely come out against the member or the applicant. And again, I know we're, we, we're not trying to be outcome determinative. We want to, applications decided objectively, neutrally on the basis of the medical evidence. But um, my experience with the various exam works evaluators are that they fulfill that function quite well. So I'll, I'll stop rambling on, but I'm willing to answer any questions that, that anyone might have. Well, thanks, Russ. You're the first person that's have that's got hands-on experience with them. So that's useful. Dick, um, Ray, have any questions for Russ? No, thank you very much. I see you, you have some other hands up. So thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Um, Harvey, jump in and then Franco. Or Franco, uh, you oh, go, ahead, Harvey. Quick, go first. Yeah. Question to staff quickly. Uh, does, does the recommended action need to include a motion to terminate our agreement with WHS when that uh, when staff deems that appropriate? We do, but in a, in a manner that would allow us to do a reasonable transition. We're not really sure how long would that take. Sandra, I don't know if you have any further comments on that. The contract, by the way, requires, uh, I think they're in a month to month extension yeah, they, right it's a, now. It's a 30 so day, exactly. 30 yes. days, but, it, but uh, I would recommend that the recommended action include uh, uh, di direction uh, to terminate uh, the WHS contract uh, effective as of a date uh, that staff determines is appropriate. I, I can live with that. Sandra, can you, is that a fair uh, motion? Yes, I think it is a fair motion. And I would recommend we give a few months, maybe through the end of the calendar year to transition and um, allow kind of finish up some of the, the items that are in progress. Great. Uh, Franco, what do you have? Yeah, I comment and then I guess kind of a, a question and I apologize. I did not read through this whole memo. I've been on vacation. Um, in the event that someone is not service eligible on a retirement, and I encouraged people to do this when they got backlogged before, uh, when I was in Dave's spot, I, would be to take a non-service disability retirement with a pending service application so they could still get paid and still have medical so that 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 is always an option but i know in a lot of these cases at least the ones i dealt with the member would get you know a, a qme on their own and then the retirement board would send them to an ime what is the what is the um what is the plan and if it's a split I think, could you repeat the question? You cut out on the very tail end of your question. Um, just what is the plan if there's a split decision between, say, the member's QME and then the retirement board's IME? Well, I, uh, go ahead, Sandra. Yeah, I would say the, the QME with the, the workers' comp process is not one that I think. I think that the IME takes into consideration when they're looking through the files, but we would depend on the IME report, but maybe I see Russ's handout up. Um, uh, Franco, I, I think the best 
the the ultimate answer is it is up to the board first the committee then the board to weigh all the medical records and all the medical reports and so just because the ime who might be who might be the last physician to review all the prior reports and records might come up uh, as with certain conclusions on incapacity and service connection those conclusions do not bind the board the board instead looks at all of them and might decide no no in this case i find this qme report to be more persuasive to me on the issues i have to decide than the IME report. So I think that's always important to remember. But moving on to a second issue, um, in my experience, workers' comp reports, whether qualified medical examinations, QMEs, agreed medical examination, AMEs, or whatever, they uh, often do uh, uh, an adequate job on issues of incapacity. But they almost never, uh, and it's a pity that, that this is the case, but they almost never do an analysis of service connection. They usually have one sentence, which is their conclusion on service connection, but they don't have any explanation. They don't refer to imaging studies. They don't refer to work incidents. They don't refer to treatment after the work incident. They don't refer to subsequent um, um, MRIs, subsequent treatment, et cetera. So, so in terms of the substantialness of the medical reports, usually, not always, the IME report, including on service connection, is more substantial than um, the reports from workers' compensation on at least the issue of service connection. I hope that's helpful. That is, I appreciate it. And then the, I guess my last comment or concern more than anything is considering, because I was involved with the negotiations on all this and we told them that this three member panel is gonna be almost impossible. Um, a lot of attention was brought to the city of San Jose a few years back because we had a high rate of disability retirements. Not having the city go, yeah, we're okay with this, and having them, you know, or we experience that again, and them coming at us and suing us or going after us because we failed to just stop trying to establish this board is a concern. Of well, it's interesting, you know, Franco, you're talking about the 2008 auditor's report, and I talked to the auditor, I liked the nice gal back then. And they just spit out numbers. I've said many times, I'm pretty sure having now looked at it, the reason why we have higher rates of disability, and I've talked to both the, the, the head of the fire, the fire chief, the you know, top fire guy and top police guy, is because we have a policy, it's all hands on deck. And you know whether you're disabled or not, you got to come to work. We have a famous case of where a fire captain um, left our, our system disabled, went to work for Oakland. And a lot of people screamed, well, how can you be disabled to San Jose and go work for Oakland? Because Oakland has a policy. When you're disabled, right, here's what you can do. And here's, you know, it's on all hands on deck. And I really wish next time the city, you know, I, city council, next time you get mad at numbers, why don't you talk to the people who actually know what's going on? This is a real, this is a real black eye for the city council because they didn't dig even one inch below the auditor's report like the rest. I mean, Dick and I, we structured the whole damn new system to address this issue. It's a huge, huge frustration for me, and I know for Dick too, Franco. It's really, it's not good. Mr. Chair, if I, if yeah. I may, Franco, um, if I understood what you asked, it's a fair question. And my only answer is going to be, or that I can offer is, um, the city actually remember, I, I don't know if you remember from my introductory comments, they actually requested information from us so they could actually issue the RFP themselves. And they still couldn't come up with anyone. <laughs> so, I mean, sure, I can't tell you what they will decide to do in the future, but at least I think they understood 
that it wasn't it wasn't that there was something wrong with the process that we were implementing for the RFP. They did it themselves, and they didn't have any bids. So hopefully that give them uh, a sense. I have always, when my staff asked me, when we have internal discussions about this, I, my impression is neither the unions or the city are really looking forward to engage in conversations about this again anytime soon, but I, I don't know what the answer is. No, I, and I understand, Roberto, and I, I, trust me, we fought pretty hard to try and not have this happen. But that definitely is a concern of mine because city council turns over and city employees turn over. And to your point um, about the high rate of disabilities, we looked into it here. And one of the things that we identified, and this is for all the non-serving members, is that our departments typically run very short staffed. We have right. one of the lowest per capita rates for police officers in the country for large agencies, which means you get to the fight first, you fight the longest. Whereas if we had double the staffing, as we should, there's at least two people there, maybe even three. Well, I, I think that's right, Frank. But I think that is what leads to the all hands on deck policy. I think you're right. That, that number, I mean, that's what we looked at. No, I, final thought, and we're dragging this out. It's not the disabilities that are causing these high numbers. It's the fact if you're a police officer and you broke your toe and didn't heal right, in San Jose, you can't be a police officer anymore. And in most police systems around the world, they'll find some something for you to do right and that's 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 an issue and by the way you know maybe, as franco points out might be a smart policy on san jose's uh part it might allow them to have fewer people doing the same amount of work but whatever any other questions i think harvey has his hands yeah jump in just jump in harvey yeah i, I don't want to prolong this but you remember I, I made some comments earlier this meeting about the code, the plan that was presented to us and our ability to administer it. This is another example where the code provides for this medical panel that neither the city nor we can comply with, and they haven't changed it. And again, this is another situation where we're, we have a choice. We, can, we could comply with the letter of the law that's been given to us and shut down our disability application process because we don't have the authority under the code to do what we're doing, or we could be we could honor our primary responsibility to our members, which is our core fiduciary responsibility, and continue as best as we can the process of considering their applications and making it happen for them, regardless of what the code says. And if the, if the city wanted to challenge us on that, it's really on them for designing a process that it is impossible for this board to follow in our plan document. So I applaud the committee and this board for keeping the member's interest primary in your minds in going ahead and trying to come up, even if we have to hold it together with bailing wire and bubble gum, we have a process that has been demonstrated to work and work on behalf of the members in fairness. And it sounds to me like what the recommended action is, is to try to make sure that what we are doing is as efficient, effective and cost effective as it can be uh, to process our members' disability applications. So. I would strongly recommend the board to adopt the recommendations presented in this item. Thank you. There's a motion by Santos to accept. Oh, oh sorry, Wilson, a second. A motion by Santos, or I have a second. Wilson, I'll second. And and I assume, Dick, that you, you go along with Sandra that they have the authority to wind down Raj Das and the authority to wind up um, exam works as as is best for our members, right? You got that right, Mr. Chair. Great, excellent. All right, let's go around the room. Well, and then the second yeah, um, right. is that is that fine with uh, Chair? Yeah, we good. Yeah, are you okay with that, uh, Dave? I am. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, Andrew. Aye. 
Uh, David Kwan. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Eshvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave Wilson. Aye, aye. As Chair Lands, I vote aye. Uh, uh, Roberto is going to take us through the last agenda item, and then we'll drive quickly through um, retirement. Uh, yeah, uh, 4G. Uh, meetings. Yes, I will turn 4G to Barbara for uh, oh, great. The presentation. Barbara? Hi, Go yes. Barbara. Thank you, Roberto. Um, Barbara Heyman, um, uh, Deputy Director. Director of the Office of Retirement Services. Yes, uh, this um, memo is uh, related to um, our requesting board authorization to negotiate and execute a first amendment to the agreement with uh, socially responsible partnerships, um, the social media vendor, to extend the term of the agreement through uh, June 30th, 2024, um, at the same monthly rate of 1500 $57.50. Uh, so back in March 2021, the CEO negotiated and executed an 18-month agreement with socially responsible partnerships uh, in the amount of $1,557.50. Um, this monthly cost is shared 50-50 between the two retirement boards. Um, the budget and um, budget for these services were approved uh, by the board as part of the fiscal budget for 2022-23. Uh, per the board's policy, approval is required for any contract that would result in a cumulative contract value uh, with a single vendor above 50,000 over uh, two consecutive fiscal years, which is the case for this agreement. Um, I can say we've been very happy with the services provided by uh, socially responsible partnerships. Um, and so we are recommending authorizing the CEO to negotiate and execute a first amendment uh, to the existing agreement. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Floor's open. Any questions for Barbara on this? Uh, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve this uh, expenditure. Motion to approve, Franco. I got a motion by Franco. Thank you, Santo. I got a motion by Avalo, saying by Santos, go around. Andrew. Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Eshbar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave Wilson. Aye. And Chair Lanza, I vote aye. All right, so um, um, uh, Maytac and Harvey are going to postpone um, 4-H because it's getting late in the day. It's almost cocktail hour here on the East Coast. <laughs> I'm going to miss cocktail hour. Um, over to you for the Maytac show on AB 361, item 4-I, Maytac. Sure. So the city count, the proclamation for the state of emergency continues to be in place, and the San Jose City Council continues to recommend social distancing in city facilities. If this board adopts these two factual findings supported by the back materials provided to you, that you may continue to meet virtually for the next 30 days under AB 361. Thank you. Okay, based on of those two factual findings, uh, do I have a motion to adopt the two factual uh, findings and continue use AB 361? Do I hear a motion? So moved, Wilson. I have a motion by Wilson. I have a second. A second, Gardner. Great. I got a motion by uh, Wilson, my Gardner. How do you vote, Andrew? Aye. Uh, David Kwan. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Uh, Eshvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave Wilson. Aye. I'm Chair Lanza. I vote aye. We'll go now through service retirements, early retirement. Hey, Harvey, can I take service retirements and early retirements together? Or Maytac? I don't see why not. Okay, great. <laughs> we take service retirements. Early. Uh, we got three service retirements, one early retirement. Uh, this uh, service retirement of Stuart M. Davies, police lieutenant, police department, effective October 15, 2022, 26.99 years service. Service retirement of David L. Parker, fire captain, fire department, effective October 1st, 2022, with 27.44 years service. Good for you guys. You made it past 25. And Sir Chairman Sean Rocha, 
police officer, police fire in effect, October 15, 2022, 22.4 years service, and the early retirement of Dean W. Whipple, fire prevention inspector, fire department in effect, is September 17, 2022, 23.77 years service. So I have a motion to approve. Motion by Santos. I have a motion by Santos. So here's a second. Second, Wilson. I got a motion by Andrew. Second by Wilson. Let's go around. Andrew. Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Benita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Eshvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. And Dave Wilson. Aye. This is Chair Lanza. Um, I vote aye. Do you want to say anything about these folks? Thank you for the uh, this is from Dick Santos. Thank you. Good, Dave. All right, from uh, from Dave. Uh, I worked with uh, Stu and worked on a lot of teams with him. Uh, we always had a great relationship and had a lot of fun together. Sean, I've known for many years, never had a chance to work together, but he's a good man. I wish him the best in retirement for both of them. And I want to I want to say uh, congratulations to. Um, uh, Dave Parker and, and Whipple uh, for their services and enjoy your retirement. Great. All right. We'll go through um, the, the, the death announcements in one moment of silence. Notification of the death of William S. Bartoshevitz, fire captain, retired May 4th, 2000, died February 3rd, 2022, no survivorship benefits. Notification mm -hmm. of the death of Walter Cap, fire captain, retired March 5th, 86, died. July 30, 2022, survivorship benefits to Dolores Capp's spouse. Notification of the death of Gilbert S. Gonzalez, police sergeant, retired August 3rd, 2000, died February 12, 2022, no survivorship benefits. This last one, I always look through these things. This guy joined the force when I was a year and a half old, and I'm now a senior citizen. So good for you, Norval, for getting a nice long retirement in. Notification of the death of Norval Pullman, Oh, I'm sorry, Pulliam, police lieutenant, retired Feb 7, 84, died July 23, 2022, survivorship benefits to Nancy Pulliam's spouse. Let's have a moment of silence. Thanks. I don't know if any of you want to say anything about these good folks. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, William Barnashevitz was known as Ski, and he was a union officer for years, a fire captain. And I worked with him, along with Walter Cap. They're very good people, good firefighters, very sad, the best of their family. Thank you. Great. Anything from the police As side? This is, this is Franco. Um, I did not know either of them, but I have to say that um, condolences to their family and normal. He set the bar for what retirement should look like. <laughs> yeah, well, he joined the force when I was a year and a half, so he had almost four decades. Good for you, normal. Uh, let's go ahead then and move on to um, any report from the investment committee, Eshwar. Uh, no, we've not had any real meetings except the AB 361 meeting, so. Great. I'll, I'll notice uh, for the record, we received the minutes from July 29, August 4, AB 361 meeting. Um, Audit Risk Committee, any report? Uh, nothing, to, nothing to report, just the filing of the minutes. Great. We'll receive again July 29, August 4, 8361. Number two, Frank, anything with governance? Nothing new to report. Great. We'll receive and file minutes from the 8361 meetings of July 29th, August 4th. Uh, Dick, anything to report from disability? Well, I, I'll go ahead and report. Uh, we had a regular meeting in August and that went well. Uh, we'll receive and file the uh, minutes from July 29, August 4th, AB 361 meeting, as well as the regular disability committee meeting of August 8th. Uh, JPC, is that you, Andrew, or you, Ashra? I forget. Is that sure. you, right, Andrew? I can take it. It's fine. Uh, yeah. We did have a meeting um, last month, and we reviewed uh, the uh, CEO salary survey um, that was conducted, and then also reviewed the uh, um, incentive compensation for the investment staff um, survey. And so that's basically what we did. We do have a meeting on Monday um, to move forward uh, with both of those items and um, hopefully make some decisions and take some more action. 
Um, other than that, we're planning to meet. I think we're going to try and meet on a monthly basis going forward until we uh, have all this stuff finalized. Great. Um, and we will receive and file the March 4th and August 10th uh, JPC uh, minutes. Uh, floor is open. Anybody from the public or any member want to suggest? I'm sorry, any board member want to suggest any agenda items? If not, everybody remember, stick around. We're going to have to. Also, I just have a quick question for council, May time, maybe. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on AB 361? I mean, are we going to be able to continue right. having these meetings through the rest of the year? I think you mentioned that you addressed that at the last meeting, that, but I think the last meeting that I attended was fed, so it was on police on fire. I wasn't sure. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's unclear whether the um, proclamation of the state of emergency will be lifted, but I think um, most everyone's cautious that there may be another wave of COVID that may be coming down. Um, I, so we'll, we'll see. The governor did pass legislation. We were going to cover it today, but we can cover that at the next meeting. Uh, pass legislation for um, hybrid meetings, um, which seems to signal that there may he may lift it starting in January, the proclamation of the state of emergency, now that there's that new law that's available. But we can discuss that in further detail at the next meeting. Okay, very well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Okay, this means adjourned uh, over to you, Maytac, for the second half of the AB3.